Um, we're letting everybody in. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Good morning. And as we are gathering, persons are getting in. We would like to welcome each and every one of you to our October 2023 Lennon N. Smith School of Religion Virtual Colloquia. At Virginia University of Lynchburg, we take pride in academic rigor with a extreme touch of relevance so that the theories that we discuss can find their way practically as you become doctors of the church, as you become bearers of an earned terminal degree. And so we are always excited when we come to this place in the year where we can gather together. I'm gonna open us in prayer. Dear God, thank you for this learning experience. Thank you for our staff. Thank you for the effort and the energy employed to make this week a huge success. Only you can now do that for us. Lord, let every person feel comfortable in this environment to find it safe, strong, and strategic that no one will be afraid to raise questions and that all of us will learn one from the other. Be with us throughout the week. In your name we pray, amen. At this time, I would like each of our staff members just to say hi to you at the uh, beginning of the week. And uh, we will start with our illustrious Vice President of Academic Affairs for the School of Religion, Dr. Marshall Mays. Good morning, and thank you, uh, our dean, the greatest dean in the world, Dr. James Edward Coleman, and to our director, Dr. Uh, Philip uh, Campbell, and all of the staff and student body. Uh, I greet you, uh, not only on the behalf of myself, but on the behalf of our president, Dr. Kathy F. Franklin, uh, our board chairman, uh, Dr. Leroy Owens, and all other faculty and staff of Virginia University of Lynchburg. Uh, let me uh, share uh, uh, this with you. Uh, on yesterday, I had the uh, uh, privilege uh, to lift a message from Genesis uh, 29. It, it's, it centers around Jacob and Leah. And uh, in that message, I made the point that uh, Lilia had a desire, a desire to be loved, a desire to be accepted because she was rejected uh, by her father. She was rejected by her sister, Rachel. Uh, and she was rejected by the man that she was in love with. She had a desire. And then she prepared herself for disappointment. She was disappointed. Uh, you'll notice if you read Genesis 29 that uh, she had four sons. And uh, uh, although she had the four sons, she thought that her husband, Jacob, would accept her. But she was disappointed. But she also made a conscious decision. If you read the 35th verse of that 29th chapter of Genesis, you'll discover that she made the conscious decision. She said, now will I praise the Lord. My point to you this week, this week, you have a desire to become the doctor of the church, but you must also prepare yourself for disappointments. Everything is not going to go your way. Your all of your expectation will not, may not be fulfilled, 
but you have to make a conscious decision that in spite of you're going to press forward and you're going to give God the glory. That's my message to you for this week. Uh, hold on to your desire, prepare for disappointment, and make a con conscious decision that you are going to become the doctor of the church. Thank you so much, Dr. Coleman. Thank you, Dr. Mays. And uh, before we go to the next uh, person, very quickly, I have a, a, a wonderful surprise uh, guest that will just say hi to you who just walked into my room. And I do want him to say hi to you so that you can see him, those of you who are on at this time. And that is our athletic director and um, head football coach here at Virginia University of Lynchburg, uh, Tim Newman. And just so that you can get a, a, a touch of dragon pride, coach. Good morning. I'm excited about being here talking to you. Thank you so much for the job you guys do. We serve an awesome God and you are awesome people. Uh, I'm looking forward to next Saturday is homecoming. And we want to have everybody in attendance if we possibly can. But we are super excited about this is our first homecoming in two years that we actually had back in person so we're super excited about having everybody there um if you can't be there in person be there in spirit but thank you so much for the job you guys amazing things that you guys do and god bless you come on let's give it up for dragon pride what a wonderful wonderful way to accelerate ourselves in the spirit of our school uh we now will move to um uh Bishop Merritt, Dr. Jackson, uh, Dr. Morton, Miss um, Mickles, or Miss Carter, if they would like, very quickly, go right ahead. You are mute, Dr. Morton. Oh, good morning, and welcome to this wonderful colloquium. I'm looking forward to the week, and I hope that you are too. Just do your best and enjoy it. Good morning, everyone. It's nice to see all of your faces. I've spoken to many of you over the phone, but it's nice to see your faces in person. Enjoy the colloquium. I'm quite sure that you will. And uh, it's good to see all of you. Have a good week. Right. All right, Bishop Merritt is saying hello to everyone and welcome. He is doing a phenomenal job and uh, he'll be working with me also where he can. And I know he may be mute on mute right now, but he has uh, offered his uh, statements to us by way of chat. And so we thank you, Bishop Merritt, for all that you do. Um, anyone else needed to say anything? All right. Well, as... Others are getting on, and I'm so thankful to see all of you. And uh, to be uh, Dr. Angelo Sullivan, between navigating Washington and being in, in Chatham, I, I miss contact with you, but I'm so happy to hear about the great things that are developing with you and each and every one of you on today. Uh, as you get a moment and you can text some of your colleagues, um, that may not be on, yes, send them a text um, so that they can realize that we have uh, gotten underway uh, with what we're doing. I would greatly appreciate that. Uh, also, at this time, I want each of you to recognize that you should have received a schedule that will help you to appreciate how the day is going to flow. And so, we are on schedule and we will try to our very best this entire week to navig navigate the terrain of each schedule and stay on time to the degree we are able so that this can be a very positive experience. I also uh, want to 
uh, encourage each of you to maybe have one of your devices, or even if you're old school with a pen, pencil to paper. Each time that there is a session that we have, have some way to make sure that you're taking notes, you're making reflections, because by the end of the week, you will have to do an evaluation of this colloquium experience. And it will make it easier for you to do if you are chronicling uh, these moments as they occur. Having said that, I am absolutely delighted to bring on now our first presenter, who is, in my personal opinion, uh, doing a stellar job as a pulpiteer, a pastor, and an academician leading our doctor ministry program here at uh, Virginia University of Lynchburg. Would you warmly join me in welcoming our director, Dr. Philip Campbell. Uh, thank you so much, Dr. James Coleman, and for those kind words. I certainly would like for you to send me your cash app so I can send you something for those wonderful words that you have just given. I, I would certainly be remiss to all of you that's on the Zoom, uh, since we are doctors of the church and those of you that will be. Uh, I, I must say this, and I'm sure that all of you had a wonderful worship experience yesterday, but uh, the Bible uh, tells me, Dr. Mays, in all things give thanks. And I just want to thank God for five souls yesterday uh, here in Danville, Virginia. God truly blessed. Two came back and baptized three. And so one for the Father, Son, and the Holy Ghost. So I just want to say to those of you that God is still saving in 2023. Now, with that in mind, I want everybody to know, as Dr. Coleman has so beautifully painted to us, that this is going to be a, a wonderful week. And of course, I'm sure you all have received the theme of this week, uh, building bridges and not walls in regard to racial injustice. And so for the remainder of my time, which I think is about 15 minutes, I just want to sh just share with you uh, what this racial injustice is all about. Definition of absence of justice or violation of right. I want you to think about that as we uh, navigate through this week. Racial injustice is any discrimination against any individual on the basis of their skin, color, race, ethnic origin. Individuals can be discriminated by refusing to do business with, socializing with, that might even be in the church. I want you to think about that as well. Or to share resources with people of a certain group. And this is what I want those of you to think about. And I want to preference this Dr. Coleman before I make these next couple of statements. I do not consider myself to be a racist. I do not, but I am race conscious. I am not a white man. I'm black. I was born black and I'm gonna die black. And so I'm not a racist, but I am race conscious. And so this is what I know. When we think about racial injustice, I just want you to think about this. That number one, that more than half of death row are black. If you would do some extensive study, you would find out that over 55% of persons who own death row are black. And the interesting piece for me that after doing this um, research, that it also revealed that the states that have the highest number of persons on death row also have a high rate of persons who had been lynched 
maybe that's something for you to, for us to think about. And I know uh, the whole concept of Lynchburg, Lynchburg, that's a whole nother conversation. And I'm sure that sometime this week that Dr. Coleman, et cetera, could give us pertinent information about that. Just something for you to think about. It is also a fact that innocent black people are seven times more likely to be wrongfully convicted of murder than innocent white people. Now, let me just say that again, because I want that to massage into your, 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 your psyche, into your emotions. It is a fact that innocent black people not one, not two, not three, not four, not five, not six, but seven times more likely to be wrongfully convicted of murder than innocent white people. And if I say chicken is greasy, find a napkin. If you want to get the information, all you need to do is go on the National uh, Registry of Exonerated Report and Google it, and you would see that. What is even more interesting to me, Dr. Mays, that it also suggests that about one third of um, unarmed people killed by police are black. If this information is not disturbing to you as doctors of the church, as we go and worship God every Sunday and we leave a worship experience and our young men are being killed in the street. Our young men and our women are being taken out at an early age, not becoming a tree, but die as an acorn. If this is not disturbing to you as doctors of the church, that all we are concerned about persons going to heaven and not having any heaven here on earth. That is somewhat disturbing to me. Let me tell you also what I know. That black people are more likely to be stopped and searched by the police, by any other race. We will be stopped and searched all over the country. Just the other day, Dr. Coleman, I, I told the church I'd have my young people uh, to meet me after service because I had the experience of being stopped by the police. It was late at night. I had one person that was in the passenger side. The policeman pulled me over. The first thing I did was that I cut on the lights on the inside of the car. And as he got closer to the car, I put my hand on the steering wheel because I wanted him to know that you're safe by coming to this car because it has been proven that most policemen have not even shot their gun and they are just as afraid as you may be. Ask me for my registration. I already had that available. And I told my young people, I said, listen, if you're stopped by the police, turn your lights on, on the inside. Put your hand on the steering wheel and keep your mouth closed. If there's anything that you want to say, take it to court. Because the odds are against you. Because the powers that be, they will not be in your favor. What are we going to do? as doctors of the church. What are we going to do? What, what, what are we going to do? And I'm not just talking about those that are pursuing a doctor's degree. But for Dr. Coleman, Dr. Mays, uh, Mary, Delphine, Morton, and myself, your doctorate degree is not a period. It's only a comma. I'm very grateful 
that in 2004, Dr. Mays and myself, we were two of the many that graduated as the first D-men graduates of VUL. And in that process, I'm still having a flashback right now, that my, my dissertation was transforming African-American males suffering with low self-esteem into leadership consciousness in the African-American church. The reason I'm having a flashback, Dr. Me, is because every time I look at him, I, I, I have to I have to pray because Dr. James Coleman was my core faculty advisor. And I, I just see a flashback of saying something, you know, on the raw. You know, there was there's a scripture made since you gave some scripture. There's a scripture in the Old Testament that there was a writing on the wall. I didn't see the writing on the wall, but I sure enough saw the writing on the paper. Dr. James Coleman, he saw me and said, Campbell, come here. And uh, if anybody knew Dr. James Coleman, it wasn't in his most pleasant voice. I knew that this wasn't going to be something that was going to, you know, uh, take me to the next dimension at that point. But he discreetly said to me in his own eloquent voice, this is not acceptable. And said to me, Campbell, I'll tell you what I want to do. I want you to do. He said, I got two boxes. Anybody know James Coleman? He has a whole lot of books. And told me, he said, go in my car and get two boxes of books and bring them in here. I said, two boxes? Two boxes? Why not one? Get two. Bring every one of them in here. Brought the two boxes of books in there. He said, I want you to write down every book because he wanted the books back. He said, now every book, I want to see it in your document. He was sharpening me to make sure that I was going to be the expert. He was making sure that this wasn't going to be a period, but it was going to be a comma for greater things to happen. He didn't know at that time in 2004 that I would be on the school board trying to help young men. He didn't know that I would be trying to do certain things in the church. He didn't know I was trying to do things in the community, but he was trying to sharpen me to make sure when I got out there in the traffic that I would not be an embarrassment to VUL. And that's what this is all about this week, for you to be a bridges and not walls. What walls in your community have been broken down? that you need to build some bridges and not walls. What walls are up just because of denominational differences? Somebody on the right side, they are concerned about, you know, that, that, that you shouldn't be wearing earrings. Another person on the other side that's saying that you can't swim. Another person on the other side that say you can't be a part of the Masons or some fraternity group. And you got persons out here that are going through struggles Persons that I think that we are answering questions that nobody's asking. So this week is not a week of futility. This week is a week to sharpen you for you to be better and not bitter. And you can't say better, B-E-T-T-E-R. Now you know I can spell. That's one thing I did learn as I was pursuing my D-Men degree. I learned how to spell. Better, B-E-T-T-E-R. I think I spelled that right. You can't say better without saying bet. And I'm betting on every one of you that being a part of V-U-L, this is not by accident. I don't care what persons say. I don't care what they have told you in the past. This terminal degree that you are working towards is going to be a, a, a wonderful experience in your life. And you're going to change the world one person at a time. The staff is super excited about this bill bridges and not walls. But if this is going to just remain that you're just pursuing just to get a degree, maybe you need to reconsider at this time. I hope I'm not overstepping my bounds, Dr. Coleman, as the dean of the school, because this is more than you just paying your money. It's more than you just saying, I'm a doctor of the church. I've said it. I want to say it again at the commencement that we have too many persons that are title rich and testimony poor. 
Hide a rich with a D men degree, but no testimony about how you are serving the community. Hide a rich with a PhD degree, telling everybody that you have a degree and no testimony. That's not what this is all about. I would rather for you to have the testimony than the degree. Because as Mays has said to us, we are servants to the servant. And that's what this week is all about. Now, listen, my time is just about gone. So what is the challenge is going to be for each of you this week? Is it going to be that after this week, when we talk about building bridges and, and not walls in regard to uh, uh, injustices that's all around you, injustices in the school system. I mentioned to you just a few minutes ago about the, uh, the, 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 the rights and, and then there is a difference between rights and privilege. I so appreciate Dr. Coleman who served on the school board and also being the chair, you see. They lost, they lost. They really lost when they put him all, you see, where well, they didn't put him all. I don't want y'all to get the wrong impression. You see, they voted them all, praise the Lord. But in the process, there's a difference between right and privilege. And many times what we don't understand when we deal with injustice is we don't get enough data. Persons all the time getting on the television and speaking on radio and not being informed, not having enough data to represent what they believe. A privilege and a right in the school system for persons to ride the bus is not a right. Persons riding the bus is a privilege. And many of them take advantage of this privilege, but it's not a right. We do not have to pick a child up in the Commonwealth. And many are taking advantage of their privilege. And so, ladies and gentlemen, those of you that have sacrificed for this week, even though it cost you to be on this Zoom. But in the midst of that, what are the takeaways that you're going to change the world even before you get your D-Men degree? It is our desire and our intent that when this week is over, that you're going to be motivated, elevated to do what your gift and your calling is. I'll close on this, Dr. Corbin, and I will yield back to you. When we talk about building bridges and not walls, and talking about the injustices in our community and in our world, will you be determined to fight or are you going to flight? We're determined that every one of you, we want you to fight. Because fighting today will make a better tomorrow. Thank you, Dr. Coleman. I yield back to you. Dr. Campbell, that was absolutely a powerful stewardship of words and time to get us thinking about this experience that we are about to encounter. Uh, just absolutely awesome. And I really want to thank you for, for that. And um, let, let's give Dr. Campbell a hand uh, in wherever you may be. What a powerful sharing. Um, I do need uh, Dr. Morton to let Dr. Dixon in, if you don't mind, please. Um, and I also want to say, as we are moving through the week, um, here at Virginia University of Lynchburg, we are fortunate to have uh, two uh, doctoral offerings, the Doctor of Ministry. Then in our School of Business, we have the Doctor of Healthcare Administration. And, uh, and in both doctoral programs, where there is virtual instruction, I want to ask everybody to take a deep breath. We're not going to ask you to get off if you can't, but I do want all of our learners and candidates to appreciate the fact that this virtual experience becomes even the more when we can see each other. 
So I know that sometimes there may be settings where it is best for you not to have your video on. And I know because of the erudite nature and the exceptional ethical codes that each of you have, none of you would have your videos not on because you're not even at your desk and you're somewhere else and just giving us the illusion that you're with us. And uh, so I am asking that to the degree you're able to please turn your videos on so we can see you. And I, obviously you would know your setting best. Uh, some of these uh, Zoom sessions across the popularized form of this have revealed some very uh, unwanted scenes. We don't want to see stuff we don't want, need to see, but if you can open your video, if you can, we would appreciate that. Um, let me see now, is uh, Dr. Dixon on? Dr. Morton? Uh, Dr. Coleman, we're working on it. I think he has a different link. So he and I are talking, so I'm gonna let him in. All right. Did anybody have any question they would like to ask of Dr. Campbell? Anyone like to make on behalf of everybody just a statement about what he had to say and its impact on you at this point. Someone open your mic and say that for us, please. Dr. Coleman, this is uh, Deborah Harris. Yes. Uh, I, I listened to what he was saying about, it. they call it racial profiling and his statistics, his data that occurs here in the South. Um, and I was, I was really impressed with him, his definition, not only of racial injustice, but when he made the distinctive difference between rights and privileges. And I just, you know, I concur with a lot of his comments. Very good, that is huge, that, that is huge. Very good, uh, uh, Dr. Harris. Thank you. All right. Dr. Coleman. Yes. This is Reverend Dr. Go Stephen ahead. Scott. I too like to uh, compliment him because Friday, Saturday, when we had our lab, he gave us some nuggets that's generated into what he said today. With God, there is no shutdown. And, and what he said on that day, the Lord came back and said, I'm still in power. Whatever is going on within our world today and, and the injustice and, and all of the improprieties of things that are going on, uh, Dr. Campbell said it on Friday. With God, there is no shutdown. Campbell, you are a prophet. I had the opportunity to be in Washington, D.C. last week for several days. And there is something about the pandering of politics, the posturing of politics. And so thank you for, for remembering that uh, to be Dr. Scott. Well said. All right, we want to continue to move us along in this fair. Ask a question here. Uh, sure. To Dr. Campbell, uh, where is it that you cross and bring into systemic racism that's built into our constitution to, uh, that leads to a lot of our uh, racial injustices? You're on mute, Dr. Campbell. Dr. Campbell, you're on mute. Okay. All right. All right, Gary, we'll hold that question because um, something happened and we'll get Dr. Campbell back on at the appropriate time. I do think that um, what we'll do is come back to that question. So hold it, Gary, to be Dr. Thompson, and we'll come back. I believe that uh, Dr. Dixon is on with us now. Again, others, uh, uh, please make sure that you alert some of our learners and candidates that the colloquium has commenced and uh, we are taking attendance. And so that's very important. Dr. Morton, could you roll the introductory statement that I 
tape that I would like us to show. If you could pull that up. Is that Dr. Campbell back on or someone else getting on? Okay. Uh, Dr. Morton, are you pulling that up for us? Hey, Dr. Coleman, you ready? Yes, ma'am, please. Bishop James Dixon, he had his first congregation at 18. So you started with 150 people in your first ministry to how many millions in June? Five and a half million people. Dixon has been a board member since 2018 and thinks he got the top job because he's a consensus builder. You're a man of faith. How does that help you execute this job? Well, first of all, faith is always a, a, an expectation of, of, of something greater. So plan well for NRT's future. He says it's also about service, corporate responsibility. During the pandemic, this facility became the place where people come for vaccination, for masks, for sanitizer. In addition to being the first pastor, he is also the first African American chairman. He remembers his parents taking him to Astros games at the Astro Dome as a child. A lot has changed since then. What better? At the end of the day, for me to be able to invite them back and bring them to the to the suite by our corporation as a chairman, only God could do something like that. And so it moves me to tears when I think about it. The job also comes with some tough problems. What are you going to do about the Astrodome? We're going to pray about the Astrodome. I'm a man of faith. And, uh, and so we're in prayer about that right now. The answer will come later. At NRG, Sherlin Chow, KTOU, I wanted you all to see that little clip because of the myriad of ways that James Dixon is being used of God, not only in the nation's fourth largest city, but throughout the country and beyond. And so um, we are delighted to bring before you our second plenary session presenter, who is now also even beyond being the chair of the Harris County Sports and Convention Corporation, which is the NRG Park, where over 500 events happen every year to include the Houston Texans football games and the NCAA Final Four, the rodeo. Um, just amazing, president of the Houston branch of the NAACP. And uh, just a genuine human being, humanitarian. Could you warmly welcome now to talk to us about the American enterprise of racism, Dr. James W.E. Dixon II. Go right ahead, sir. Let me say thank you so very much uh, to my mentor, uh, friend and uh, esteemed uh, scholar, uh, Dr. James Edward Coleman, Jr. And uh, I'm honoring him today uh, because he deserves that. Uh, he is uh, beyond any reasonable doubt uh, a scholar and uh, a luminary among us. And we're grateful to have this relationship with him. Uh, as well, of course, as uh, the Dr. Marshall Mays. Uh, good to see you, sir. Thank you so very much uh, for your mentorship and leadership as well. And of course, uh, Dr. Philip Campbell. Uh, what an esteemed uh, scholar he is as well. BUL is certainly blessed uh, to have a cadre of, uh, of great men and women uh, who are uh, astoundingly astute. And uh, so we're honoring each of them. Of course, Dr. Uh, Brenda Morton in her own right, we honor her uh, on today for sure. Uh, and of course, to all of the esteemed uh, professors, 
uh, who join us on, on today uh, and the students, the learners uh, in the DMIN program. I am James Dixon, honored to be and humbled to be uh, uh, presenting uh, to us on today. I am uh, most proud uh, to be a 2018 uh, doctoral graduate of VUL and, uh, uh, and the Leonard School, Smith School of Religion uh, there at VUL is par excellence. And uh, I'm glad to be in the first class of Leonard and Smith Fellows. Uh, and uh, so uh, I greet you as a fellow dragon. And uh, I hope that you uh, hold that in high esteem. Uh, and uh, it is not uh, the size of the dog in the fight is the size of the fight in the dog. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I, I hope that you embrace that. Uh, hope you embrace that. And uh, certainly so. Uh, great things can come out of Nazareth. Uh, uh, yeah, I see a few heads nodding. I guess not all of us believe that, but but, mm -hmm. but great things can come out of Nazareth. Yeah. And uh, don't don't underestimate Nazareth. Don't <laughs> oh, don't yeah. don't take Nazareth for granted. Don't no, do, sir. please 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 do not do not devalue uh, the origins of Nazareth. Uh, wow. Uh, uh, I, I just I want to say that to us today. I know that there are larger footprints in terms of typography and uh, in terms of architectural splendor uh, at other places. But I need to say to you, Bishop Mer Mary, am I right about it? Don't, don't, please don't underestimate Nazareth. And, uh, and uh, you, you are, you are in a place like an unto Nazareth right about now. I want you to, I really want you to know that that you in a place likened unto Nazareth, and you need not underestimate Nazareth. But Nazareth produces people like you, uh, who come out of the shadows and uh, and are able to make enormous impact. And people, uh, as 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 the Scripture David says, "You have made me a wonder." You Talk, have made Bishop. Me a wonder. Talk, Bishop. And I, and, and I want. I, 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 I want everybody that I'm talking to right now, uh, uh, if I could wake you up a little bit. I know you're black. You got something in you to say something. I, now I want to say something to you. Uh, you need to really just stop for just a moment and thank God uh, for for Nazareth and uh, and really, 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 really embrace, really embrace this, really yes. embrace this, all right? And uh Bishop stay so there two I, more minutes, two more minutes. We give you two more. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I really want to say it because uh you know everything that God is doing with my life right now uh has a Nazareth, a Nazareth, a Nazareth element to it. And uh so uh it's praise God for, for, for Nazareth. Yeah, don't uh yes, sir. Praise God for, for, for Nazareth. Yes, sir. Uh, I, I want to uh, uh, say to you today, I'm honored to be with you. I want to get right to my assignment, and uh, uh, I'm humbled to do so. Uh, Lord, use my mind, mouth, and muscles for these minutes for this conversation. In Jesus' name, amen. Uh, amen. I want to, as Dr. Coleman indicated, talk about the... Uh, uh the american uh uh enterprise of racism uh i want to talk about racism as, as as an american enterprise with us on today and uh uh and uh we've sent the document to dr morton she'll probably make it available to all of you as well so that you can have it uh the entire all my notes for the lecture uh, in your hand. Uh, racism, I purport, is an enterprise. Enterprise. We hear the term structural racism, and we'll talk about that in connection to this term enterprise. It is a complex project that requires continual efforts to maintain. 
it is contrived a contrived construct that is necessary for maintaining the maintaining of power by the one percenters the one percenters in america who also wield global power and uh and and i want uh you in your in your own time to really become a acquainted with the one percenters. Uh, in this system, economic power is the primary concern. Economic power is the primary concern. Uh, uh, from the outset, America has a problem. And that problem is an economy built on racist ideology. Uh, that's from the outset. When you read the founding documents of our nation, uh, one has to understand that uh, uh, racism uh, and racist ideology is in the founding uh, founding essence of the of the nation. We mm -hmm. do know that the founding documents uh, that declare liberty and freedom were not meant for everyone, but for a, a very small minority. Uh, and uh, and we have to understand that that the original documents were not developed in a pure environment not in a pure environment, but in a very twisted, tainted, and uh, uh, sadistic environment. We, we, we really have to understand understand that. Uh, and you, we get from that the economics of slavery, uh, the economics of slavery. Few works of history uh, have exerted, I'm gonna read this, this quote uh, from Dr. Stephen Metz uh, and uh, of the Gilda Lerman Institute of American History. Uh, you write this historical context was the slavery sl was slavery the engine of American economic growth, and it's by Stephen Mintz. This is a very important document. Uh, few works of history have exerted as powerful an influence as a book published in 1944 called Capitalism and Slavery. Its author was Eric Williams, later the Prime Minister of Trinidad, Tobago, and Tobago. He charged that black slavery was the engine that propelled Europe's rise to global economic dominance. He maintained that Europeans' conquest of the settlement of the New World depended on the enslavement of millions of Blacks who helped amass the capital that financed the Industrial Revolution. Europe's economic progress, he insisted, came at the expense of Black slaves whose labor built the progress. He insisted, uh, this came at the expense of black slaves whose labor built the foundations of modern capitalism. And I, I want us to think about this, uh, the fact that the, 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 on the backs of black slaves, the economy or the foundation of modern capitalism was built, modern capitalism. And, uh, and there's a lot to be said about that because in 2023, approaching 2024, uh, in this context that we minister in, and as you are studying and learning as in, in this program, you're gonna study a lot about context, context. And of course, you're, you know, if you're a pastor in a minister, ministry, you have a church context in your community, uh, in your city, in your state, then in your nation, and then we live in a global society. So we have to understand the global context that we're in. And as such, we have to understand uh, the various forms of economy. And when we talk about capitalism, uh, modern capitalism, neo-capitalism, we have to understand that the foundations of capitalism, uh, which is filled with all kinds of disparities uh, and dysfunctionality, is founded on the backs of slave labor. And it's very, very important for us uh, to grasp and never, never lose sight of that reality. Uh, I'll, I'll comment on that a little bit more. The mistake we have made, I believe, for over 150 years is to respond to racism as a malevolent social construct without understanding the purpose and origins of social injustice. Uh, let me repeat that and slow it down a little bit. I believe that uh, a severe mistake we have made for over 150 years is that of responding to racism as a malevolent, malevolent social construct 
without understanding the purpose and origins of social injustice. But racism is an enterprise that produces manifestations of social injustice that are necessary for maintaining wealth dominance and power by the elite few. Is this making sense? Uh, yes. Uh, and, and so the manifestations of social injustice uh, are symptoms of the enterprise. A and if we address the symptoms without understanding the enterprise, we'll forever be chasing ambulance lights, police arrests, mm -hmm. disproportionate killings of blacks by police, you know, the latest unjust firing, uh, you know, the brawl that happens on the boardwalk, we'll be constantly responding to the symptoms, but not thoughtfully addressing the root causes of those systems, which is the enterprise of structural, structural racism in America that exists by the contrived thoughts of the one percenters and those who work on their behalf in order that they maintain power. So this is the American story. This is the American story. Slavery was an industry that had its roots in the basic need for a workforce that could be used for the economic advancement and advantages of whites and the one percenters. Um, slavery did not exist because white people hated black people. Slavery exists because white people needed black people. Sometimes I get rude and I interrupt, but that was powerful. And it's all right to interrupt if somebody wants to say something. Because I, 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 I want to make sure we're, you know, it, it, it wasn't that they hated Black people. They needed Black people. Dr. Dixon, this is uh, Dr. Harris. Um, they, uh, some historians note that they tried with some of the other uh, races, but they found because we were able to handle the sun, the heat, and other things that we made a better uh, vehicle for what they were trying to accomplish. And, and exactly, and that is about economics. Yes. You see, it, it's 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 as. Uh, it's, it's just as true as deciding what kind of vehicle to use for a certain assignment. If, you know, I I, I ride horses, I, I have horses. So I own a pickup truck <clears throat> because, because I could not hook up <clears throat> my horse trailer to a Mercedes Benz or, 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 or to a Ford Taurus. So the vehicle that I use is a pickup truck because I have to carry hay and feed and carry, and pull my trailer. So they looked upon us economically. And, and until we really understand our economic value, we'll never understand and take ourselves seriously. So that that's, let me, let me move, I, I wanna move on that. I think you get the picture on that. Uh, as Stephen Mintz further states, slavery was indispensable to European development of the new world. It is conce incon inconceivable that European colonists could have settled and developed North and South America and the Caribbean uh, co without slave labor. That's mm -hmm. inconceivable. It, it could not have been done. The way that North and South America and, and the Caribbeans were developed required, from their perspective, the engine of slavery. Moreover, slave labor did produce the major consumer goods that were the basis of world trade during the 18th 
and 19th centuries. Cotton, coffee, rum, sugar, and tobacco were amongst the leading products. Th these, these, the, these, these products uh, drove the economy, drove, drove the economy and world trade. Uh, these were the consumer goods. And of course, America, the, the, the South, produced these goods for the most part and then other parts of the country as well. And so we have to understand that slave labor built the world economy. Mm -hmm on the backs of Blacks here in America. And America has been that driving economic engine through the maltreatment of Blacks since slavery and continues today in what we call modern capitalism. I, I would drop this on us that uh, capitalism, uh, capitalism, the former, the form of American capitalism that we are familiar with requires several things. It requires one, deceit, deceit. It requires deceit. It requires violence. And it requires supremacy. There's never been a time when America, American capitalism has not required those things to operate. What was the third what thing? The, the first was deceit. The second is violence. And the third is supremacy. The racial hierarchy which is dominance. And you notice in the book of Genesis, when God says, and you know, biblical economy, as opposed to, you know, American economy, uh, God says, let them have dominion over the fish, the sea, the fowl of the air, right? Remember, right. Uh, gave them control, the dominion over the earth, subdue the earth. Genesis one and two, it's about economics, you know, Adam, and Eve, they're in the Garden of Eden, not a ghetto, not, not a ghetto. He said, all right, but American capitalism requires a ghetto. <laughs> you see? And, and, and so we're talking about this later. Public policy has always perpetuated the existence of ghetto, generational and cyclical poverty. Uh, but the Garden of Eden is not a place of poverty. God never made man to live in ghettos. We were not created for that, like fish for water, mm -hmm. man for garden. And uh, but when God says, let them have dominion, it's over the fish of the sea, the fowl of the air, the beast of the field, the cattle, and all that move along the face of the earth. Check it out. Fowl of the air, that's poultry business. Fish of the sea. That's seafood industry. Beast of the field, ranching, cattle, over the earth. That's gardening and mining, the minerals within the earth. But God never said dominate a person. No, never. And, and so we don't get the, 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 the motif of people dominance until after the fall of man. Along with me. All right, let me let me let me continue. Let me continue. In the pre in the pre Civil War United States, a stronger case can be made that slavery played a critical role in economic development. One crop, slave grown cotton, provided for over half of all U.S. export earnings. Doc Dixon. Yes, sir. Can can I just interrupt? Please. Because Please. you just said something very powerful. I don't know if they were listening. In reference to the dominance, the sea, the land, and the air. Mm -hmm. So after the fall, 
I want you to talk about because there was a mindset. There was a difference in the mindset over against in the innocent piece to conscience. Yeah, the mindset change. I, I I want you just to talk about that a second because that mindset uh, was a game changer. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Let, let me let, let me say this. The here's the reality. Uh, before the fall, before Adam and Eve fell. There was no consciousness that would allow human dominance because there was no consciousness of superiority or inferiority. And, and, and so, uh, and it works both ways. The sin, the sin defected mind, the, the sin, <laughs> oh God, the, the sin. Are y'all are y'all are y'all awake? Yeah. Yes, we're on mute, but we can hear you. I can hear you. Mm -hmm. The the sin defected mind will be manifested in both ways. One, a consciousness of supremacy and superiority, mm -hmm. but two, a consciousness of inferiority. You you can't see yourself as inferior unless your mind is defective. Amen, amen. Uh, so, so it is in this that we understand that uh, it is a warped theology that causes a warped psychology. And a warped psychology then leads to a warp, warp sociology. If I don't see God right, mm -hmm. then I can't think right. Amen, amen. And I can't think right about me or you. So my so sociology gets affected by my ideology and my psychology because I've got a warp theology. Yes, sir. My, my. <clears throat> you see, because... If if my theology is wrong, my anthropology cannot be right. And, and if my anthropology is not right, my psychology is messed up. So ultimately, sociologically, we can't treat each other as equals. I follow. I follow. We're operating from the perspective of a sin defected mind. Uh, yeah. So so. So, so it is in this, it is in this that we find, uh, you know, the, the essence of what our real dilemma actually is. Mm. What, what it actually is. Okay. Uh, I, 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 I want to, I, I, there's so much I want to illuminate here and expound on, but I know I've got, you know, I've got uh, time constraints uh, that I've got to honor, so I won't get fired. Uh, but... <laughs> Let me let me say this too. When we understand that black slave labor just on the cotton crop alone provided over half of all US export earnings. Yeah. That's major. So by yes. 1840, the South grew 60% of the world's cotton. By 1840, the South grew 60% of the world's cotton and provided some 70% of the cotton consumed by the British textile industry. Thus, slavery paid a substantial a share of the capital to iron, and manufactured goods that laid the basis of for American economic growth. In addition, precisely because the South specialized in cotton production, the North developed a variety of businesses that provided services for the slave South, including textile factories, uh, meat processing industry, insurance companies, shippers, and cotton brokers. 
right? And, and let me just say to us, so, so now you've got this partnership in the enterprise, the South growing the cotton and the tobacco and other goods, and the North processing, manufacturing, shipping that work together. That's interesting, yes. Okay, and, and, and so I, 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 and too often the North gets a pass. <laughs> oh yeah! Uh, oh yes. But 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 I but I want us to understand that uh, when you really understand how the enterprise works, you, you'll understand why the North gets a pass unworthily so. Not not worth it. Uh, and by the way, one of the things that 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 I I, I like to do when I go to a town or a city. I'd like to go see some of the original long-standing businesses and buildings. And and uh and you you know you go to a town and you see on the old building cotton exchange. Yeah. That ought to mean something to you. Yes, yes. Yeah. Slaves right? working. <laughs> well, no, slaves didn't work at the cotton exchange. They grew the cotton in the field. Yes. So that the cotton exchange could operate. So a, a friend of mine a few weeks ago, he's a county commissioner here, and uh, he, uh, uh, you know, he's an amazing guy. Anyway, but he was downtown Houston, and uh, he he's he's spending money painting these murals on the sides of buildings in downtown Houston. I mean, incredible size murals depicting you know equality, justice, ending hunger, fighting trafficking. I mean, he he's a radical like myself, and he's just. I mean, changing the whole face of downtown with the stuff. When he had a, 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 a white woman friend of his looking at this mural on the side of, of the cotton exchange building. And, you know, she comes from a wealthy family. He comes from the hood where his father cut grass for the white people to make a living. So they're, they're looking at this mural and she's admiring it. And she says, wow, my grandfather worked in this building. Hmm. And he said, wow, and my grandfather grew the cotton that gave him a job. <laughs> so so I, 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 I really want us to understand our story within oh, yeah. this construct of the American story uh, as it relates to the, the enterprise, the, the enterprise. Let, let's come forward from the 1800s to the 1900s, mid 1900s. How many of you have studied Lee Atwater? No. Lee Atwater. Yeah. You, you got to read about Lee Atwater. Uh, he was an advisor to Ronald Reagan. And, uh, and I'm quoting him now. Lee Atwater said these words. Start off, start off in, start off in 1954 by saying nigger, nigger, nigger. By 1968, you can't say nigger. That hurts, and so it backfires. So you say something like forced busing, states' rights, and all that stuff. You're getting so abstract now, now you're talking about cutting taxes and all these things which are totally economic things which are a byproduct of Blacks getting hurt worse than whites. We want to cut this. We want to cut this in such in, in such such so, so much more abstract than even busing the busing thing and a hell of, of a lot of abstract, more abstract than nigga nigga nigga. Now, this was a conversation that Lee Atwater was having with inside operatives who gave advice to Ronald Reagan. Start off in 54, nigga, 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 nigga. By the 1960s, stop saying nigga because that becomes offensive. And start using these kind of cold terms. See, I, I want us to understand that this is how the enterprise and the and structural racism exists very, very thoughtfully. Very thoughtfully, you see? So, uh, in rage, I'm calling them niggers. And then slowly change the vocabulary. See, change the phraseology, meaning the same thing. Amen. Amen. But 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 they won't fight it as much because 
on the extreme, it was nigger, 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 nigger. So now it's no longer the extreme, it's busing. Mm -hmm. You see? Uh, <laughs> I, I, it's, cu it's cutting taxes. So we didn't respond to that with protests. We didn't march about cutting taxes. Even though cutting taxes was to, 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 to what? To advantage the white and the wealthy. But we didn't have public protests and sit-ins about cutting taxes. At least they wasn't calling us nigger. Okay. Now, uh, this was the strategist, I'm talking about Lee Atwater, and advise, uh, advisor to Ronald Reagan. A president, a lauded president, a revered president of the United States, and still today. And he is well known for his trickle-down theory of economics, which never came down. But we clearly see that his economic policies were influenced by the ideology of, 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 Lee War, of, of Atwater. It's, it's racism in disguise. Racism in disguise. All right. Reagan used his charisma to get many Americans to support uh, economic policies which favored the 1%. He stoked fear, immorality, and distrust of Blacks and others of color. He connected this racist ideology to what it meant to be truly American. And please underscore truly American. Okay. Uh, I want to suggest that you read uh, anything you can get your hands on by uh, Professor Tricia Rose at Brown University. Uh, and she talks a lot about structural racism. Uh, and one of the things that she purports, and that, and that I agree with, every aspect of life is impacted by the enterprise of racism. Every aspect of life. Employment, healthcare, education, employment, healthcare, education, business, banking, insurance, the environment, criminal justice, media, employment, healthcare, education, business, banking, insurance, environment, criminal justice, media, housing, mobility, food and nutrition, voting, religion and church. Every one of these entities is vastly impacted by structural racism and the enterprise of racism in America. Every one of them. That's powerful. Let me give you a couple of, 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 of uh, examples from this list. Uh, I, I, let me say this, healthcare. I'm working right now on a huge Medicaid issue, and uh, and I'll I'll send this to you. So in uh, February, this past February, the Center for Medicaid and Medicare uh, in D.C. Uh, CMM, make a note of that. Uh, issued a bulletin uh, that it's considering a policy, a Medicaid policy that will cost billions of dollars to hospitals across the country while the larger hospitals would lose some funding, mid-sized mid community-based hospitals and clinics and rural hospitals will almost close. Mm. In Texas alone, just in Texas, the number is about $8 billion. We're working on 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 on, on a campaign right now nationwide, Texas, got, now we're working in Florida and other key states because people, now we don't know anything about what's happening. We don't even know that's going on. And this is this is about to happen, could happen in the Biden administration. And it goes adverse to Biden's philosophy and ideology. But these are bureaucrats within the Center for Medicaid and Medicare. By the way, this policy nuance is a carryover from the Trump administration. But these are bureaucrats, not politicians. 
So the question has to be asked, if President Biden is not supporting this, why are the bureaucrats in CMM still considering this kind of adverse policy change that threatens the healthcare safety net for the underserved? Because there is big money behind it because it will create adverse effects for those like us. You see, so I, I don't want to get too much into the Medicaid issue, but I'm just giving you an example about healthcare. Uh, food and nutrition, food and nutrition. My God, uh, uh, some of you might want to consider this kind of thing thought for your for your for your for your doctoral you know uh, paper for your thesis. Who understands racism as it relates to food and nutrition, and how that relates to to poor health? We're right now in our county, Harris County, one of the largest counties in the nation, about to uh, we're about to vote on a referendum. $2.5 billion referendum, almost $3 billion, to build a brand new public hospital here in Harris County. And uh, it's the Lyndon Baines Johnson LBJ Hospital, going to build a new. And but, but, but before we would decide to support that referendum, we've had like 20 meetings with the Harris health officials and all the next officials and insisted on what we call a community benefits agreement. And in that agreement, there are three major areas. One is the elimination of health care disparities. Because we were not going to support a referendum to build a hospital that did not take seriously the need to address the elimination of health care disparities, much of which is caused by adverse realities in food and nutrition. So now in this new development, it's going to be a center for healthcare disparities, the elimination of them, with black universities doing the research, how can we eliminate food deserts and nutrition deserts for minorities in our community because that's what's killing us? You, you see? So that's one of the areas. The, the others. But my point, food and nutrition. Uh, how about the environment? Environment. When was the last time you heard a conversation about environmental injustice, environmental racism? So, give you an example. Uh, I've been on the forefront here fighting against concrete, uh, 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 you know, these batch plants yes, in and near black communities. You'll never find a concrete batch plant near a suburb. Amen. But how do they conveniently locate themselves within walking distance to our neighborhoods and our churches with no adverse reaction? And so our people get sick and die from all the infection that comes from these plants while we're shouting on Sunday. We're hooping and shouting and singing and, and, and dancing and speaking in tongues. And around a corner, the death trap is the concrete batch plant that's environmentally infected our people. You see? All right. So so it's it's very important for us to grasp. In every facet, I, I could go. I, I could give you something in each, in each one of these categories: media, housing. You know, you know, the Fair Housing Act was passed in 1968. 1968. But here's the reality: Black home ownership in America is still nearly the exact same in 2023, percentage-wise, as it was in 1968. Why is that? We'll talk about public policy in just a minute. So then, then there are the dog whistle codes of the enterprise. This is how you can recognize the enterprise when you hear it. The dog whistle codes. Got it? Uh, 
uh, Ian Delaney Lopez, professor at UC Berkeley, author of Dog Whistle Politics, uh, says what to do, uh, what do the faces look like when you think about these terms? Let me just ask the question. When you hear these terms, illegal alien, welfare queen, freeloader, entitlement, inner city crime, drug testing for welfare recipients. What 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 faces come to mind? Talk to me about it. Black faces. Black faces. Illegal alien. Brown faces. Mm -hmm. Welfare queen. Who that look like? Black women. Yeah. Black women. <laughs> yeah. Okay. All right. So so inner city crime. What comes to your mind? Black teenagers. Black teenagers. Black young people. Right now, so I'm saying this terminology is intentional terminology. So the white stru uh, ra stru stru structural racism, in in the enterprise system promotes these kinds of terms. Hey, Dr. Jackson, I didn't see you there, sir. Uh, let me honor you. Uh, the system promotes these terms and embeds these codes in the minds of the social consciousness. Inner city crime, inner city crime, inner city crime, as if there's no crime outside the inner city, as if there is no white crime inside the inner city. But the, but the term is used image-wise to create fear for Black people in the inner city. Our big problem in America is inner city crime. Our big crime in America is not crime on Wall Street. A big crime in America is not uh, banks overcharging Blacks' interest rates on loans. A big crime in America is not the problem that Blacks of equal income, equal credit can don't, don't get approved for housing loans at the same rate as whites. Yeah. A big crime in... Are y'all hear what I'm trying to say? Yeah, well, I hear you. That is a big problem in America. That, that's not a big problem. That's not a big problem. You see, all right. What faces what what faces come to mind when you hear these these terms? MAGA, oh silent my. majority, heartland, moral majority, real Americans, patriots, states' rights. Mm -hmm. What comes what 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 face comes to mind when you hear those terms? Whites, okay. White. You're white. Okay. All right. So the images of blacks and, and other people of color are all related to negative terminology. Heartland. Moral majority. Silent minority. Majority. Make America great again. Great again. Patriots. And blacks have fought in every war. But Amen. we don't associate patriotism with being black. Am I making sense? Yes. Okay. So all this is dog whistling uh, to perpetuate the, the structure of the American enterprise of racism. I'm almost done. Racism is a belief in hierarchy of human value. Please get that. Racism is a belief in, in a hierarchy of human value that some people are in, inherently simply worth more than others. That's Heather McGee, uh, president of, of VMOS. Uh, listen, so it's important they will understand that this is the role of the operators of, of the enterprise to perpetuate the belief that those who are worth more deserve to have more, to control more, and that those who are worth less deserve to have and control less. Can you repeat the definition again, please? I'm sorry. No problem. 
racism is a belief in an hierarchy of human value that some people are simply worth more than others. Based on that definition, the role of the operators of the enterprise is to perpetuate this belief. Dr. Dixon. Yes, sir. When the Constitution was first written, it wasn't it written so that the more money you had, the more votes you had? Yes. Right. So so so, so understand that that throughout the, the the construct of American life in all those facets, media, housing, banking, criminal justice, religion, church, this is the inherent belief. And those who are keepers of the system operate through practices and policies to perpetuate to perpetuate the constructs that keep the right people in power. Professor William Darity Jr. Uh, uh, is somebody you ought to read, by the way. Uh, you, 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 ought to read, you ought to read him. Uh, he states, the origins of the struggle for independence on the part of the 13 colonies, that struggle was deeply linked to the attempt to preserve slavery. The founding documents were a declaration of liberty for minority, for minority Americans. It did not include blacks and technically did not include women. And so what we see now in modern racism is a continuation of the same ideology. It is not new. Dr. Patricia Rose of Brown writes a book on the gears of structural racism. It's a must read. And of course, everybody in my class, you need to put this on your, on your list, on your list, right? The gears of structural racism. Here's the definition. Structural racism in the US is the normalization and legitimization of an array of dynamics, historical, cultural, institutional, interpersonal, that routinely advantages whites while producing cumulative and chronic adverse outcomes for people of color. That's a classic definition of structural racism. Thank you, thank you. It's the normalization and legitimization of an array of dynamics. These dynamics are historical, cultural, institutional, interpersonal, and they routinely advantage whites while producing cumulative and chronic adverse outcomes for people of color. Can somebody think of one of those outcomes? Imprisonment. There you go. Mass incarceration. Yeah. Anybody think of another? How about double-digit unemployment? Yeah. Okay. That's chronic. Poverty as a whole. Generational poverty. Okay. I would like to How say a, a lack of generational wealth. Yes. Lack of generational Absolutely. How about gentrification? Oh, yeah. Would that, that, would, that would, the re, would the redistricting this thing of the attack on the vote and redistricting and all of that, would that fall into that kind of category? For sure. For sure. Redistricting, uh, gerrymandering is a part of the enterprise's tactics. Now, I'm just going to drop this in right now because I'm I'm wrestling with this even with my own church and, and trying to get more people engaged in this. Uh, how many churches have a 
social justice ministry. We have that at Peace Baptist Church. We have one. Okay. Where where are you located? Washington, D.C. And what, what church is that? Peace Baptist Church. Y'all, let's praise God for Peace Baptist Church. Amen. Amen. Okay. I, I'm saying, but but we don't, that's not a part of our normal apparatus, is it? No. Because we're still building churches around choirs, you know, music and preaching. And, and the best known ministers are the ushers and the greeters, you know, <laughs> and the deacons. And all that's household maintenance. That's not ministry. <laughs> <laughs> I, 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 I'm just, I, I don't mean no harm. I'm just saying, I'm just saying, all of this is going on destroying us, and we're focusing and majoring on things that won't save us. Dr. Dixon? Yes. I, you, 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 you hit a nerve for me uh, because I, 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 I just want to say in that vein, what you just said, there's a difference between church work and the work of the church. Yes, sir. And we yes, deal sir. so much with church work and not the work of the church. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. I, I, I want to say this. I don't, I, don't, I don't mean to demean or belittle. Uh, I'm just saying that maintaining the household operations, you know, it's like uh, if you have a house, you have housework. Correct? Yes. You got to clean up. You got to wash the dishes. You got to make up the bed. You got to vacuum the carpet. You got to dust the furniture. Yes. But if all you do is housework, you won't have a house. <laughs> Somebody in that house got to go to work. <laughs> oh, my God. Hey, man, I get the picture. Somebody got to go to work. Yeah, something hasn't and happened you, outside. And when somebody asks you, what work do you do? You don't talk about your housework. Yeah. I, I'm just trying to ask, uh, uh, Brother Philip Charles Jubert, am I making sense? Am I making sense? I'm, not, I'm just, please tell me if I'm making sense. I'm, I'm in, uh, Miss, 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 Miss Desiree McCray, am I making sense? I mean, if when somebody asks you, what kind of work do you do? You don't say, I wash dishes, I vacuum my floor at home, I clean up the bathtub, you know, I, I, I fold clothes. You don't even mention that. Your mind yeah. goes to where you go to work to make a living. Yes, sir. You're, ap you, 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 you're hitting it on the head. You're absolutely right. Um, we... <laughs> We major in, I don't want to say the minor sometimes in, in our churches, but mm -hmm. what you're saying, we have to have that. But the ultimate goal, like you said, is to reach those who need our help, who need the yeah. help, who need the help. Yeah. We yeah. used to have a social justice. Um, I won't say we used to. We still have it. But the members that were on our ju social justice ministry um they've died some of them have died off and no one has come has really come along to fill those spots so to speak so you you're you're absolutely right you're absolutely right sir uh, thank you, god you, for you. you thank you thank you i'm gonna try to wrap my comments up I'm, i i just want to say that uh uh one of the challenges we do have miss McQuay, to your point is that the the generation of African Americans now, <laughs> uh, uh, our challenge is how do we get Black folk in our churches, in our communities, to value those who do social justice work from a ministry motif enough to join our churches and help us do it? You see. Uh, and a part of our, our, our thinking as doctoral students has to be how do we, how do we educate and motivate
this generation of church members to take social justice as a serious ministry worthy of their investment of time, talent, and treasure. And I would, if I was writing a paper, I would say, in my abstract, I describe it that the problem. And then I would say, if we continue not doing so by developing churches that are disconnected from and disengaged in the process of addressing structural racism and the enterprise that continues to debilitate us, we will all but lose everything that is necessary for building a viable black community. But if we collectively engage in discussion towards solutions and use our collective influence to inspire new generations to take this ministry seriously, we can not only save the black church and black America, but we can be the vehicle that God uses to save the soul of America. Amen, amen. Let me let me try to finish. Hold on to that because that's that's really where we're trying to go. Now, uh, uh, Patricia Rose also calls our attention to the reality that there has been a very explicit ideological war for the past 40 years between the story of structural racism and the emerging now dominant story of colorblindness. That's that's where the where the tension lies. There's a story for 40 years of structural racism, but it's being countered by the story of colorblindness in America. And particularly when Obama got elected, you know, that became the new the, the new narrative. We now live in a colorblind society. And and, and so all this attack on critical race theory and the elimination and removal of slavery and racism from our con from our textbooks, all that's about this whole nuance of let's create a colorblind society where race is not a part of the discussion. And that's not easy to, 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 to deal with, but we got to talk about that, all right? So it's my deduction that these factors are evidence that structural racism is indeed an enterprise. It is legalized, a legalized and physically protected entity that gives whites advantages in every life facet. This is why it's so difficult for whites to permanently fail. And conversely, why it is so difficult for people of color to permanently succeed. Please underscore that. This is why it is so difficult. Dr. Campbell, you got to calm me down. This is why it's so difficult for whites to permanently fail in America. But it's also conversely so difficult why it's so difficult for blacks and others to permanently succeed in America. Oh my God. Okay. Let me give you just one quick, 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 quick piece uh, okay. on, on this. Thing. Haven't you seen white business people? Fail, 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 and fail, and still succeed. Oh, yes, all the time. I mean, they can fail, file bankruptcy, chapter this, chapter this, chapter this, and still come back and be billionaires. All the time. <laughs> A Negro can get one car repossessed. You forever, no, yeah, we can't trust you. I mean, I mean, yeah, doc, yeah, yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. You know, uh, Martha Stewart can go to prison. Mm -hmm. 
Come on now. Yeah. And I'm I'm not I'm not I'm not saying she shouldn't be able to recover. She should. But a Martha Stewart can do that. What happens to us when we go to what, gone ever? I mean, tainted. Are y'all flowing with me? Yes, 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 yes Doctor. It is difficult to permanently fail and be white in America, but it's very difficult to permanently succeed in America as a person of color. All right. I have a problem how they differentiate the white crime collar, the the white collar crime, and the blue yeah. collar crime. A crime should go. be a crime. It shouldn't be based off of the color or the category of the blue or white, because yeah. I don't understand how, uh, and I just had this conversation with someone last week, how a mayor can go to jail and then come back and get back in the seat as the mayor, but yet a black man can go to jail and can't come out to vote. I don't understand. Or get a job. Exactly. Or get a job. Or get a job. Yeah. But yet you can go right back and govern a whole town, but yet yeah. the black man got to then go resort back into that residual of going or recidivism, they call it, yeah, right. going right back into the jailhouse because he needs to go out here and sell or sell drugs, sell, steal or sell drugs to put food to on the table for his family. Miss Sisley, you preaching the gospel. Well, so, and, then, so, and then and then we, uh, the only thing that gets reported now uh, on the news is Basically, black crime every day, all day, every day, all day. Right. Because that's that keeps the definition going. That keeps the dog whistle language alive. <laughs> it perpetuates the system. Now, now that's media, right? So that, you talk about for the ball. You talk about media. All right. Now, who controls media? That's what you got to understand. So, so media doesn't own itself. And then let's go back to what you piggyback on earlier, because I, you hear often how the uh, the the Make America Great Again will talk about that Ronald Reagan theology. But then let's go back to it strokes fear in the minds of the white people from what those white channels that white people, that black people are so evil and that we're out here to kill people and to, to, to destroy property and to, to do all manner of evil things when they portray us in the mindset to stroke fear that, guess what, will keep division among the black and the white people. Let me, and you're so right. Let me tell you what else it does. Dr. Coleman, knows my time is up. I'm, I'm about to shut up. I, 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 I see your hand. Yes, sir. Let me, let, <laughs> let me tell you what else that does. The more you put black faces on the TV screen for committing crime, the more you educate younger blacks to say, this is what you do when you're black. It, 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 it works both ways. It's because if that's what you put on the screen every day before my before me, that's what I see, that's what I see black people doing, black people doing, then that's what that that that's that's what it must mean. To be young and black in America, you you live like this, you talk like this, you dress like this, you commit these crimes, you go to jail, you come out because I see myself in those images. So so we really have to understand it. But 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 where is the black church partnering with social justice in any one of our cities or congregations that's having that conversation with the media, or that's having that conversation with the business community in your city? Because the businesses sponsor those news shows, don't they? When they take a, a news break, now the ad comes on. That's who's paying for the media. So if we don't have those conversations with them, we'll never change what's on the screen. Okay, let me wrap this up. My time is up. There was more for me to share, but uh, I, I'll have to end it there. And uh, if anyone have a question or comment, Dr. Coleman, thank you. I can, wait, you're, on, you're on mute, Dr. Coleman. Dean Coleman, you're on mute. All right. Let's give Dr. Dixon a great big hand for that tremendous uh, lecture on the um, 
whole notion of the American enterprise of racism. I allowed that to go a little longer because I knew the substance that you would get. And we will continue this discussion throughout the entire week as different presenters shall come. Now, what you're going to do now is we're going to go into breakout groups and you're going to be in breakout groups. And Dr. Dixon, I hope that you will join uh, me with the new learners. And you're going to go up until uh, 1225. Then you're going to break for lunch until one o'clock. And then at one o'clock, you're going to go into... Uh, your first class uh, session uh, for the week. And when you go into the breakout groups, uh, you're going to spend a little time, some of you with Dr. Mays, Dr. Jackson and Dr. Campbell, just to maybe ask a few questions together about what Dr. Dixon just shared, uh, to look at the abstract. And the same is going to be done uh, for uh, the new group in which uh, Bishop Merritt will be with me in that group and we will have an opportunity to just talk a little bit about what was said, the abstract, and uh, do some things with the manual. And so at this point, Dr. Morton, if you could divide the group into the proper groups. And uh, what a massive experience that we just encountered from one of America's great minds. Dr. Dixon, you're brilliant, and I thank you for sharing with us. Uh, Dr. Morton, put us in those breakout groups at this time. Okay, thank you everyone and give us a couple of minutes to get you in the room and, and accept the invitation when you see it on your screen.
Uh, Mr. Lawrence. Yes, ma'am. Um, would you accept the invitation to go to the breakout room? Okay. I can't win at the moment because I'm at work and I'm Okay, going... well, that's fine. It's just you. Uh -huh. Okay, you'll be in by yourself. So I just want to make sure you got the invitation. Right, I did. I did. Okay. I, All right. I will, I will, I will uh, give them that. A text a little later on and see if Dr. Jackson and I we can meet at a later time. Okay. 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 Dr. Morton, did you hear me? Yes, I did, Mr. Lawrence. So we're okay. okay. All right. Okay. Okay. All right. racial injustice. To be sure, walls are necessary to differentiate and protect the church from the contrary practices of the world that contradict our biblical ethic. Yet, the walls of racial injustice threaten the quality of life for the Black church in particular and the soul of America in general. This leads us to the need for a serious, crucial conversation about the role of the church practitioner and the black church in addressing this matter. This dialogue should be centered around building bridges that will dismantle the American enterprise of racism. Okay, stop right there, Dr. To be uh, Desiree McCray. Uh, and I hope all of you was following her. Uh, she said, she read that this leads us to, to the need for a serious, crucial conversation about the role of the church practitioners. Let's stop there. I'm putting the period right there for a moment. The role of the church practitioners. Who are the practitioners in the church? Let's talk. You can unmute we yourself. Are. Uh, uh, the leaders of the church, we are. Okay. We are the practitioners in the church. The problem I have, what is our role? As we deal uh, with a racial injustice in the church, building bridges uh, instead of walls. What is the individual leader, the pastor, beginning with the pastor, the bishop, uh, the uh, uh, who, whatever title you may have? Uh, uh, what is your role? Doc, Dr. Mays, I, I would think my, my first role was to, was to educate uh, my congregation. Because I, I see that a lot of people doesn't, do not understand what social justice is and what social justice is all about. And uh, as, a, as a pastor, 
my role is to begin to educate. And once we educate, then we can move into a place of, of, of responding to, to ministries that, that, that needs to, that we need to be reaching. Uh, I, I've been in churches for a number of years and, uh, to be honest, when you talk about growing up uh, in, in, a, in a Pentecostal church, we were just local in our community. We didn't reach too far beyond the church wall. But now I, I think because we are in a place where, where things are, are, are before us in such, such great magnitude that we need to start doing something. And in my church, that's what I'm trying to do. I'm trying to educate in my church is, is not... Uh, it's more senior than than there are young people, but I'm still trying to educate them about social justice and how we need to move beyond the church walls. So I would say one of our first things to do is to to educate those who do not understand what social justice is all about. All right. Anyone else want to chime in? Uh, uh, Dr. B. Garrett Thompson said educate. How did do- if no one else, let me ask this. How do you go about educating, uh, and, and I'm picking back on you, Thompson, uh, uh, seniors uh, who are used to uh, accepting the slave mentality, uh, uh, that way of thinking, don't want to uh, uh, trouble the water, uh, how you educate them the importance of being participants. Yes, I think it's great. Back to me. No, no. someone else is saying. Uh, Stephen Scott. Dr. Bay, some, one of the things that has me perplexed is as, as, as um, Dr. Thompson has said, we're now dealing with senior citizens in our churches. We do not have as such the um, generations. And I'm going to go with the Y and the Z generation. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to leave the X gen alone and the millenniums alone. But, but when we talk about seniors, we now have to come with a transformation of what Dr. Uh, Dixon was talking about. And he, 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 he brought us in at eight, early 1800s. To late uh, to to mid 1960s. However, when you have the mentality within our churches already that that there is a separation of church and state, we first have to break it down as to what it is that we need as a people. And and I think what Dr. Dixon was saying was that we need to. Um, correct that within our churches. Now, some of the other issues that we're going to have is how do you go about evangelizing to get those that need this in the church? And I think I think Dr. Uh, uh, Thompson was, was asking that very same question. How do you go about changing the mindset of our church structure as we go forward with this? All right. Uh, uh, thank you, uh, uh, Dr. DeB, Stephen uh, Scott. Anyone else want to chime in? Uh, because uh, yes, Dr. Mays? Y- yes, uh, Jabir. Yeah. yeah, I think it goes back to what was said by Dr. Campbell at the beginning of the lecture today. He said, I'm not a racist, but I'm a race conscious. I'm race conscious. Um, you know, all my life, I, if I talked about being black, white people would say to me, well, you're racist. And I think that that helped me when he said that he was race conscious and Dr. Dixon said that we should not be colorblind. And a lot of times you talk to Caucasian people, they're colorblind to what has gone on around us. So starting just with some terminology to encourage our people that we're not, you know, we're not racist, but we're just we're just trying to be conscious of what's going on. And that goes back to this text, a need for serious, crucial conversation. Okay. The bird, all right. And one else want to chime in? Uh, Dr. Dr. Bays, I, just, I just wanted to say one thing. Um, piggybacking on what Gary said about education, one thing I was encouraged by, I read something in the paper the other day 
about a church in the state of Florida that had started to teach their young people about Black history. And that was the result of Florida deciding not to teach children about topics that could cause them to feel bad about themselves. And even liberal white parents were in agreement with that because they didn't want their child to feel bad if black history, civil, specifically civil rights, slavery was taught in public schools. So the church took it upon themselves to start educating their black children about their history to make them feel good about themselves. And there's no way that you can argue that that would go against church and state. That's just teaching people about their heritage. So, you know, the argument has been made that the children should learn about that in their homes. And that's true, but some parents aren't equipped to teach their kids because they haven't been taught themselves. Right. So the fact that the church can step in along with Sunday school, along with Bible study, and teach those children about their heritage and their history is a blessing. And so that's one way that we can educate our youth and the church could take on that role. Dr. Mays, uh, to piggyback on that, uh, this is uh, Angelo Sullivan. I am probably the youngest person in the room. Um, and what I've, what I've learned is that uh, in order to reach the older the generation in regards to social justice, we have to put it in context and make, have them understand that though it may not be affecting them directly, but they have children and their children have children. So in order to reach them and have them understand that we have to put that into perspective that they see it in regards to they need to have the best mindset and thought process for their children and the generations to follow behind them. So, though it may not affect them, again, like I said, it just it affects the people that fall underneath them. So we have to be um, pushing that agenda or pushing that thought to get them to understand that it's bigger than just the senior, I would say, generation. It, it goes beyond that because if, if, if the dynamic changes for the younger generation, then how does, you know, how will the world change overall? If, if we, if they all locked up, if police are killing them, you know, we're killing ourselves. It doesn't, it doesn't go beyond that. So we have to push, you know, like we have to protect our next generation in order to, you know, get that thought process in their mind. Dr. Mays, uh, uh, I want to just, if I can just jump in and say two things. One, is being pro-black doesn't make you anti-white. Um, and, and that's something that that uh, white people understand. If I'm for black people, that doesn't mean I'm against you. I'm just for me. I'm trying to help me. Uh, and, and the other thing for us at our church is it's not the older people. The older people are the more radical people who understand civil rights. It's mm -hmm. True. That, that that don't understand civil rights because they came along with all the privileges and they don't understand sitting on the back of the bus, uh, having a drink from a, from a fountain that says blacks only. And so we try to teach them black history uh, so that they will understand what we had to go through to get to where we are. I mean, that's what I want to say. That's a good point. Um, Mr. Nathaniel, and I wanted to let me piggyback off of you because as we were talking and I was hearing that we need to educate our seniors, our seniors are the <laughs> ones who was out there fighting. It is it is that generation of people. It's it's the generation now. I want to say the 70s, 80s and 90s babies who have stopped the fight. You know, we, we weren't out there um, even right now as far as, you know, with the government possibly shutting down. Um, over the weekend, you know, we are too afraid to get out there and stand up 
for what is right for, you know, when we look at black people, you know, the black life, the, the killings with uh, George Floyd and, and, and all the, the profiling of police. And that did not just start. That was way back in Martin Luther King time. And, and, and here we are decades later, sitting on the sidelines because the reality is when he died, didn't nobody else want, they, they were too afraid to lose their life. He didn't mind losing his life, but everybody else behind him, as we are coming along, we really don't want to get up and take up the fight that he started. But the reality is we have to get back out there. It's the young people that we need to be educating on getting out there and standing up for their rights because we have rights now as to vote. And what we are not using is that power to say, I elected you in this office to do us a job for me. I can take that position because I voted you in that position. And I think the moment we as a people start with, the, and it's not really, let me just go black and white because this is not a color problem. This is not a racial problem, excuse me. This is a people's problem of that we're, we won't tolerate people just treating us any kind of way and, and continue to profile in our young black boys and, and, and continue to putting us in jail. This We have to start opening up our mouths and, and, and we need to get in the game and stop sitting on the sidelines, point blank. All right, anyone else? Dr. Uh, May. Uh, Dr. Uh, 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 all right, uh, and I'm um, um, doing it again with that, Anton Miller. That was yes, sir. I know I heard somebody else, but uh, I, I was going to. I think that was Dr. Brown. And that was Gomillion. Oh, okay. All right. Well, what I was going to say is, uh, me, I take a pretty much a scriptural point of view with that. Uh, Isaiah 10, where it starts off, woe unto them that write unrighteous decrees, grievousness that they have prescribed and then turn aside judgment from the needy. And on everything that was said, all of it feeds into it. What Dr. DeBee Little was just saying, we've gotten comfortable in our younger days. There are a lot of us that were more radical than when we had actually got something. Once we've reached middle age, once we've gotten a house, we sometimes withdraw ourselves from the struggle. And we become silent when those unrighteous decrees are being written and confronting racism, social uh, injustice, social justice. We have to focus on the area of social justice that works for us, because I think the civil rights movement that was started with uh, the administration and even A. Philip Brandolph beyond that was hijacked by every other movement when it came to tagging on to civil rights and a bunch of different uh, kinds of social unrest, disease and disease that's happening now because there's that generation that have withdrawn themselves. When we look at what was going on with the Black Lives Matter movement, they didn't wanna be involved with the church, didn't want us out there, which lets me know uh, that somewhere we disengage for, disengaged from our young people and we have an opportunity that we can get back to them but it will take starting from what was said at the beginning with dr to thompson it's going to take some education okay uh anyone else before we go to the next paragraph dr yeah. mays i just would like to say that uh the scripture always said that we had to train up our children and that we need to talk to them about our experiences and, and you know, our, our, our experiences as black people. And the one thing we all know is that the Jewish people always, if their kids didn't go to a Jewish right. school, they, they taught their children at home about their religion, about their experience, about what had happened to them. And they never let go. You always hear about the Holocaust. They, you know, Every year you hear about the Holocaust, but we have uh, a black history programs and we're done. We move on and we go on to the next thing to celebrate. And so we kind of own this ourselves to teach the children, constantly teach them, uh, have them read the books. You know, uh, I gave my grandson, who's 10 years old, uh, the, the book by uh, Woodson, uh, The Miseducation of the Negro, that 
we need to start putting stuff like that in front of them instead of just always video games and things. Wow. Wow. I like that. Uh, great. I do. Anyone else? I just like to add, I do see a need for social justice and the Black Lives Matter and all those things. But I really think that it starts with who we do we see ourselves, who we identify, do we identify our, ourselves as, um, you know, Christians and people of Christ. When we think about like our health, like we should be in health so that our soul prospers. And overall, like our food <laughs> through generations has been poor because we've seen ourselves through slavery and this was the food that was available to us. Unfortunately, our people are still eating it. And the biggest enemy that we have in America for African-Americans of all generations is the food that we eat that, you know, puts us in a hospital, gives us heart attack. Every, every, we want to build more hospitals. I see building more hospitals is the same as building more prisons. What we need to do is build up our minds mind and, and really educate ourselves like this is who we are and God does not call us to eat this way you know if we truly see ourselves as equal we need to be fighting for supermarkets fresh foods this and the other and educating our our, our kids and our elders everyone um along those lines okay that's uh Amen. Dr. B. Roberts Marisa yeah. Marisa yeah. Oh, yes. okay. all right anyone else Building bridges, not walls. And we must admit that racism is still alive. Not only within the uh, broader community, but believe it or not, uh, in the local community that you live in, racism is still alive in various forms. Uh, there was some... Caucasian people, white people, uh, that drive by my house uh, uh, daily. And uh, I've seen it set on my porch. And I just don't have a camera out there far enough to the road to get the driver license, the driver, the license plate that automatically throw trash in front of my house. It's a form of racism of all the other houses. Uh, on this road, uh, these rednecks, uh, every opportunity they get. And I have to go out there and uh, pick that up. So racism is still alive, but how do we go about to build those bridges? How do we connect? Uh, yes. Yes. Dr. Mays. Yes. Dr. Mays, this, this is Brandon. Doctor, this is the president of the Virginia Baptist State Convention. Dan no, this this just Darren Brandon. <laughs> uh, I wanna I want to um um uh, maybe take it up to another level. Um because um the question ought to be that the other question we ought to consider is that when our congregations or when we are uh, engaged in liberation theology and social justice ministry, what, what ought be our response when those who don't look like us are planted in our churches, in our individual congregations that will either um, rail against us sharing about with us having a social justice content in the message or to the other extreme that um, um, someone that don't look like us will write an article about us and use a black face over that article to talk about our context because we are so, so social justice involved or liberating we are liberating ministry is so um, engaged. I raised this query because um, just recently, um, my next door neighbor, um, past the church next door to us, um, there was an article written in the newspaper about him. He 
because he was, because of their ministry, is so socially engaged and because of the, uh, the preachment that he gives to his congregation and even the uh, enlightenment he gives in terms of liberation theology and social justice. And there was an article written and the article initially had a black face to it. And she made it seem as if she was a member of this congregation. But then when we look behind the scene, it was some conservative from down in Florida. Wow. That was talking about this church that's in Norfolk. That's wow. doing that's doing phenomenal work in the community. And when I say that we're side by side, uh, it's just a, a block between us. And they have a food pantry. We have a food pantry. We're feeding every week. But here's a conservative in Norfolk that put that puts a black face on some a black face on an article and sends it out. And Go Million knows exactly what I'm talking about in the area. So what ought be our response when we are doing the work? And yet there's some in, the, in our own congregation don't respect the work of the, the work that we're doing. Well, that's, a, that's a good question. Who can respond to that? I, I, I think you just have to, um, I have some other thoughts, uh, but thank God for Dr. Brandon, or my, my, my brother. I mean, I, I think that all you can do is just respond intelligently to the work you do and uh, or how God is speaking to you, because God doesn't speak to everybody the same way. He speaks to us within the context of where we are and who we're ministering to. And 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 our ministry is uh, uh, toward those who we see and deal with. Uh, and I don't think anybody can really attack that because they're not they're not in your context. I mean, I mean, that's what I think. I mean, I think that's how you would respond to them. Just saying, I'm doing what God is telling me to do. And you doing what God is telling you to do. And, you know, that that's it. I mean, you know, that that's what I think. Uh, I, w I was going to say, uh, though, that one of the issues that we have and 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 one of the things that I think got Dr. Martin Luther King killed was when he wanted to unite both black people and white people around economics, a poor people's march. And what really causes us problems is when uh, our brothers who are Caucasian are convinced to vote against their own interests. Because if you black or white, if you make the same amount of money I make, What's good for me is good for you. Mm -hmm. But but when you're convinced to vote, to vote against your own interests by being told that I'm your problem, when, when in fact, it's literally all about money. If, if that makes sense, to what, what I'm saying to you, that if, if you make the same amount of money I make and you're a different color and you vote against something else, you're literally voting against your own interests. All right. And, and that we talk about building bridges. That's one of the bridges I think we need to build is with people who are convinced to vote against their own interests. I mean, if we live in the same neighborhood and it's a food desert, that don't just affect black people. That affects everybody living in the neighborhood. But people have been convinced that they're better than you because they're white. Well, but, but I'm saying that, yeah, I, I get that. But the truth has got to be, if if we if we in the food desert and I'm black and you white, it affects all of us in, in, in the neighborhood, in the area. I agree with you. And they got to be convinced not to vote against their own interests. But they need to know themselves. I wonder how many of them are readers and read documents what 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 this bill entails even they don't they say we don't read but they don't read either they just they believe whatever somebody tell them but i'm but yeah i get that i'm just saying that's one of the bridges we need to build talking about local stuff 
Well, you know, Dr. Bill, your case in point, but it was you were saying there are a whole lot of poor Southern whites that did not want Obamacare, but they were happy to receive the Affordable Care Act without <laughs> even knowing it's they the exact same thing. <laughs> okay. They Can don't we... read either. <laughs> Let's let's go to the next uh, 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 paragraph, uh, 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 Doctor DeB, Desiree McCray. Okay. Excuse me, Doctor Brown. Um, Doctor Mays, you mind if I put it on the screen? Do the you can abstract. You can. How's that? Is that okay? Uh, it's coming up. It's too. It's small. Can you enlarge it? You may have to enlarge it on your end. I've I've got mine maxed. So can you enlarge your size? It's pretty large on my screen. Yeah. Okay, operate from there if you can. All right, all right. Starting with the uh, third paragraph. Virginia Correct. University of Lynchburg has a storied history embracing a philosophy of self-help and independence advanced by iconic personalities like Gregory Willis Hayes, and Vernon Napoleon John. Only in recent history, under the leadership of immediate past president Ralph Revis, has VUL asserted a pivot towards self-help and interdependence. Is collaboration the answer to the undoing of racism, or does the invested time and energy only result in the building of more walls of racial injustice? Okay, let's 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 stop there and uh let's uh discuss uh uh self help and interdependence. Uh how do you uh uh, uh define that uh that philosophy of Gregory Willis Hayes and Vernon Napoleon Jones? I'm waiting for comments. Self-help and interdependence. Well, if you know, Dr. Mays, the, the history of Virginia Seminary and College, I'm sure you do. Um, the American Baptist wanted to come in and kind of take over. But that the early fathers of our school wouldn't let that be done. They wanted to remain independent. Of course, Virginia Union accepted the help of the American Baptist Home Mission Society, but um, Virginia Seminary College did not accept that. We wanted to be independent. All right. Anyone else? Dr. Revis, Dr. Revis, uh, who is resting uh, uh, with the Lord now, uh, he has several books that was printed on self-help and independence and the two schools, Virginia Union and uh, 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 Virginia University of Lynchburg, Virginia Seminary and College. I recommend that uh, somehow, some way that you will get your hands on some of those books that will uh, uh, highlight and explain the history Thank you, sir, for holding that up. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Javert. Uh, you you have it. Uh, you have it. Get those books. It will help you in understanding the philosophy, uh, not only of uh, Gregor Willis Hayes, but also of uh, uh, Vernon Napoleon Johns and uh, Ralph uh, Revis. Uh, anyone else want to share? Uh, um, uh, the philosophy of uh, those three giants. If if I could, uh, uh, Doctor Doctor Mays, um, uh, as I read Doctor Reeves's book uh, on Apostles of Self Help, one of the things that I saw with as it relates to self help and interdependence is the recognition that we cannot assume that somebody is going to do what we need to do for ourselves better than we can do for ourselves. Wow. And we need to take responsibility uh, for looking out for ourselves and strengthening ourselves uh, because 
what I what I discovered in reading his works is that if we allow other people uh, to do the strengthening, they can also, when they want to, do the tearing down. So that's one of the things that I learned and I discovered in reading that. Wow. Thank you, Dr. Tabi Combs. Thank you, sir. Anyone else? And if you don't have uh, uh, the book, uh, I think it's a free on, on campus uh, in my old office. Uh, just uh, uh, let me know uh, by way of email, and uh, I will do my best to see uh, that you uh, get one. Okay. Dr. May. Yeah. Dr. Yeah. May. Dr. Jackson. Uh, I've been notified by the administrator that our uh, class, this session ends at 1225, giving us time for our lunch break, and then our class starts back at uh, 1 o'clock. Okay. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Jackson, a good timekeeper. Uh, uh, and I, I do hope before the end of the week, we can get back to this abstract. Uh, 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 thank you so yeah, much. By my time is... 1229. Okay. And okay. Uh, we'll come back at uh, one o'clock for our next. Yes. Uh, Dr. May. Well, class. Yeah. Dr. Dr. Morton, I think I recognize the boys. Yes, sir. Thank you, Dr. Jackson, um, for that. And I want to tell the folks that's in Dr. Mays and Dr. Campbell's group that when you come back, you will be in a separate room. If you see an invitation, select that invitation and go to the room with Dr. Mays and Dr. Campbell. The people that are in Dr. Jackson's class, you will stay in this room. So you'll come back to the room. You won't need to do anything. That's it. Okay. Well, thank you, Dr. Martin, for those directions. And we'll see you at one o'clock. All right. Don't do it yet. Okay, good afternoon, everyone. Okay, uh, all right, we want to uh, begin, and this session is going to deal with the front matter of your uh, dissertation. Only the front matter only of your dissertation. We will have another section on the body of your dissertation and also the back matter. Uh, let me begin by uh, 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 saying that uh, any dissertation has three main components. Any dissertation has three main components. The front matter, number one, Number two, the body. Uh, number three, the back matter. All three components makes up the one document, your uh, dissertation. How you formulate that is the task that we will deal with 
uh, for the next uh, couple of days. The front matter is our interest for today. Dr. Morton, are you able to pull up uh, uh, the information that I sent you? Thank you so much. Thank you so much. All right. If you will move Dr. Morton to the very next page of that information. Dr. Morton. Hold on one second. Let me get my screen to. Okay. I can Dr. Mays. Okay. Somehow my screen got short. Give me one second. Okay. okay, if you can pull it up to the next page. All right. Can you all see it? Okay. Can everyone see it? I can. Okay. All right. This is your cover page. Very important that the cover page be correct. Underneath of your title of your dissertation, for example, this one bringing the bridging the gap between the church and prison. You see the learner's name, the candidate's name, John Doe. Common D men. You see his first degree under that a bachelor's of studies, University of Lynchburg, 2008, Master of Divinity, Virginia Union University, uh, 2011. It must be done just like this. Pull up some more. Dr. Morton. Okay, right here, right here, right here. The next thing is the core faculty advisor. John Doe, whoever your core faculty advisor may be, underneath the name is the title core faculty advisor. At the bottom of the page, it must be final documents submitted to the doctoral studies committee and partial fulfillment of the requirements for the degree of doctor of ministry. And then you put the month and the year of that graduation, which will be, for you, it will be in May of 2024. The cover page must be right. If not, Dean Coleman will reject it. That will the template in the manual, doctor ministry manual, that 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 uh, you can use to do your cover page. Any questions? I just have one question, Dr. Mays. Where, yes. Um, where you are listing, where it, where the, uh, the schools are listed. So in my case, I am in another seminary school, but I will finish the Doctor of Ministry before I finish the Master's of the Biblical Studies. Is that for only degrees that you have? Do you do you or, have? Uh, let me ask, do you, you do have a bachelor's degree, correct? I have a bachelor's, I have a master's, but it's my master's is not in a biblical. It, it doesn't happen to be. So my, so my question is, uh, is that only for degrees earned or could I still put the other seminary school, even though I'll, it'll come afterwards? I will, I will list the degrees that I have earned. 
Okay. All right. Okay. That was a good question. And the other question concerning the cover page. All right. The next uh, 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 piece of the front matter that you should be concerned with, go all the way down, Dr. Morton. Dr. Mays, this is Tammy. I'm sorry, I do have a question on the cover page. Okay, all right. Um, for the example that we have in the um, manual, it looks exactly like this, but it also has B-U-L at the bottom. Lynchburg, Virginia. Right That's above the graduation month and year. Oh, uh, you are correct. You are correct. That's uh, You are correct. You're exactly right. Right before the uh, month in year, you should have Virginia University of Lynchburg. Uh, and either way, Dr. Coleman, we are excel. Another question. The copyright page. There's an example before you. Copyright, the letter C in the circle, 2014, John Doe, all rights reserved. The copyright page. Very important. Okay. Any question on the copyright page? Okay. Dr. Morton. This is very, very important, included in the front matter. If you would turn to page 123, and Dr. Morton, you don't have to do this if they have their uh, manual. Page 123 in your manual, it, it, it should be titled Final Document or Overview, Front Matter. Do each of you have that? Page 123, annual demand manual. Do you have it? I'm not getting any response, Dr. Morton. Yes, no, I, I have a different. Um, Dr. Mays, did you tell us again what the page is supposed to say on page 123? 123, the final document overview. Dissertation project, final document overview. No, don't say that. Uh, okay, Tammy said yes. Uh, I don't say that. I'm telling I have it. You have it? Yes, sir. It's, oh. it's, it, it, well, if they had the older manual, it would be in page 119 if they're working with the older manual. And if you work, thank you, uh, Dr. DeB, David Penn. If you're working with the old manual, is one what, David? 119, sir. 119. On page uh, 123 or 119, you'll see front matter, the title page, the copyright page, and then the table of content, abstract, acknowledgments. All of you see that? Yes. It lists what's, what's mandatory, and it also lists what's optional. There are some things in the front matter or you can uh, leave out and there are others that you must put in. Okay? Now, for example, on the screen, 
it has the dedication that's optional. Only dedication pays the author names the persons from whom this dissertation and this uh, uh, book is written. It is for the author to decide whether to have a dedication or not. It's not necessary to identify the person to whom the work is dedicated to. Uh, for example, good examples, you may dedicate it to your wife or your husband, your spouse. You may dedicate it in memory of someone to your father, or to your mother. It's optional. You do not have to put it there. I did it. I dedicated a, a page. Okay? So, you have the title page, the copyright page, the table of content. Uh, Dr. Morton, I think, I think I have an example of the table of content. You may have to pull up another document, the second document that I sent you. If you can share that along with what you have now. If not, if you don't have it, Dr. Martin, on page, in your manual, on page 122, there's a, a, a template of the table of content. Dr. Nice. There you go. I see it. This is your table of content. And the key thing about the table of content is you number those pages at the bottom center of the page. So here how it works. The copy page will first a number, page number is page number one. The title, the, 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 the copyright page is two. The abstract is three. Roman numbers. The acknowledgement, if you have it, is four. The dedication is five. And uh, uh, most, if not all documents, should have a glossary, which is page six. Or however you may be, that number may run. Then you go to your uh, introduction. Any questions? And the page numbers must be lined up. Remember, they, they, they wanted to keep things to remember. Uh, uh, that in the front matter, all page numbers are Roman numbers. In the body, all page numbers are numerical numbers. Dr. Mays, may I ask a question? Yes, uh, Dr. B. Gary Thompson. Uh, into, isn't the introduction a part of the body? Uh, uh, and you're, you're, you are correct. And that is, I was going to get to that. Uh, make the introduction should be numerical uh, at the page one, numerical number center uh, of, of the bottom page. Dr. Jackson is your uh, co advisor, uh, Dr. To be Gary Thompson. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. You have a good one. Another question. The front matter. You get that right, you halfway through. All you need to do is, is read the manual uh, uh, on page 123, on page uh, 122, 
and you follow that and you will have the the front matter uh, 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 done. Refusal to do that is where you're going to get in trouble. And I advise you clearly that when you are doing your table of content, that you make sure all number page numbers are lined up. Don't have one over here and one here. It's going to take time to do it, but you can do it. That the other thing I I I, I want to encourage you, and I, I wish Dr. Campbell was on. Uh, the glossary is very important. You are using terms that you are assuming that the reader knows the meaning. So you include a glossary. So the reader will know what you are saying, what the term mean. Question. No question. So for terms that we use, you know, can we use Webster's to get that definition or Google or yes, you know? ma'am. Okay. Yes, ma'am. Uh, uh, and if you if you're using Webster and you're using Google, make sure you put okay. Make sure it's footnoted. Uh 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 Terabrin, the latest edition. Okay. Also, one other question. If we have books, seminary books, where they have a different, where the author has a different definition than a Webster or a Google, could we use that definition? You can. Okay. If, 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 yes, you can. Okay. Thank you. All right. Another question on the front map. And and if you look at the screen at the glossary that Dr. Morton uh, uh, pulled up, uh, there was a definition for 10 terms used to work the document. And at the bottom of the page, if you pull down some, you see the footnote. That's how it should be. And if you notice, uh uh the 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 footnote uh most of most of those terms if you notice it came from a website okay pull down some more dr morton Okay, thank you. Again, be aware of the footnote. If you go back up, the page ends. Go back up, Dr. Morton. All, all right. The, the page, keep going, Dr. Moore. That's is Okay, that's where I want to be, right here. You, you, you notice that before going to the next page, the writer, the author, lists the footnotes of every definition on that page. Then, come on down, Dr. Morton. Keep going. All the way down. Go down some more. Once you reach 17, now the footnotes listed for those definitions. Okay. Any question? Let me ask this question. How many of you have already 
formulated uh, a copy page. I have. You, you got Thompson? I've done, I, I've done most of my front matter. Good. Good, good, Dr. DeB. Gary Thompson. Uh, uh, Dr. B. Tammy, you started to thought you start did you start to say something? Yes, I've started already. Okay. All right. Mm -hmm. uh, and and uh, uh, Dr. B. Thornton and Thompson, uh, uh you're following the template that's in the manual. Following it exactly. I yes. Like <laughs> yes, sir. And you Dr. cannot go wrong. <laughs> Dr. Mays, I just have one question. Um, when you went over 123, page 123, you had like the final document overview. Um, well, when you went over the overview, you said that the dedication is optional, um, but there's a disconnect between what's on 123 and what's on 142. 142, let me turn to that page, 142. Okay, go ahead. Okay, so 123 has acknowledgements. There's no optional there, and there's no optional by dedication. But in 142, it lists both the acknowledgments as optional and the dedications as optional. Okay, thank you for bringing that to our attention because 142 is, is, is correct. Uh, dedication is optional. And acknowledgments are optional as and well? Ac acknowledgments uh, is optional. Okay. All right. And the other question. Thank you, uh, Dr. B. Tammy Thornton, from, and we'll make a note of that. Okay. You're welcome. Okay. Uh, 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 Dr. B. Uh, Deal, where are you uh, on the final project? I'm actually finishing up the results of the model this week. Um, I haven't started on the um, dissertation. Okay. All right. Okay. All right. Dr. DeB, uh, Charles DeBear. Still doing the results, sir. Still doing the results. Dr. DeB, David Penn. Hopefully, uh, results will be done uh, by the weekend. Hopefully, had some setbacks, but hopefully by the weekend, sir. Okay. Dr. DeB, Cicely Lilla. I'm sorry, Dr. Mays. I'm sorry, you were saying? Yeah, uh, I was asking, where are you on the final project? Have you started uh, or are you working on the results on the model or, or, or where are you? I'll be getting started on my paper. Okay. Uh, I believe, uh, Dr. Morton, that's all we have. Dr. Mays, may I ask a question? Yes. Um, I put that uh, front matter in 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 new uh, Moodle. Uh, and I need to get some feedback on that. Who will be giving me the feedback? My uh, advisor. Your core faculty advisor. Okay. And that's a good thing to do now. Uh, do uh, a draft of your uh, front matter and uh, 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 load it up on Google or even by email uh, to your core faculty advisor. Get, get advice now. Don't wait until after you submitted the final document to receive some uh, feedback. So thank you, uh, Dr. Uh, uh, Gary Thompson, to be. Dr. Mays, I have a question. Are we going to get a more detailed schedule of, of like milestones that we have to meet? Um, we've kind of had that all along for both of our, you know, the first year and second year. 
Um, are we going to get a detailed schedule that goes along with the manual? Uh, uh, I, uh, you should, but let me say this. With the new eight weeks Moodle uh, assignments, uh, those things, the deadlines and all should be uh, included in those assignments. Keep it in mind, you cannot and will not get a grade mm -hmm. for anything uh, until you complete that eight-week uh, course that uh, whether you're in the uh, first year of fall semester or the second, uh, uh, first year, second fall semester or whatever, but you should get a detailed assignment. And Dr. Morton, uh, will you please make note uh, that we will uh, – uh, consult with Dr. Campbell and Dr. Coleman about a detailed assignment, a schedule that they may have. Yes, I'll, I'll have that. Okay, thank you. So it won't go to the core reader until the entire draft is complete, right? Uh, you can, you can uh, uh, depend on your relationship with your core advisor because each core advisor, each teacher are different. Uh, uh, you can uh, submit, as I stated, in pieces. For example, the, let me uh, show my core faculty advisor uh, the, the template or the draft for my front matter. Okay. Oh, I meant the core reader. Oh, the, the core, core reader. reader. Yeah, that we were assigned. Um, no, well, we're year. Doing, yeah, yes. Uh, 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 your core two reader, consult them even before you submit that final document. Okay, thank you. Consult the core to reader. And that's very important about the entire document. To get the, not only your uh, doctor to be Tammy Thornton, not only your core reader, but your adjunct professors. Because if, if you keep this in mind, a vote. It's going to come from your core reader, core two reader. A vote is going to come from your adjunct professors. A vote is going to come from your uh, 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 core faculty advisor and every other person on that committee. So you need to let them see, at least review, in order to give you advice before you submit that final document. You do not want to come to the meeting and your core reader or a jump professor say, I'm just as confused as confused can be. I've never seen a front matter look like this. And that will happen. I've seen core two readers and that joint, uh, a joint uh, professor uh, 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 throw the candidate underneath the bus because there was no relationship. So make sure your core two reader, your adjunct professors, review your document, beginning with the front matter. And let them know, even though they may be from another school, uh, 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 train of thought, let them know that you, your work is done according to the Virginia University of Lynchburg Doctor of Ministry uh, program. Okay? Good advice. Thank you. Good advice. Any question about the front matter? If not, the next time we meet, which will be this week, your little assignment will be a draft of your of a front matter. Each of you must do that draft, have it at hand, email it to me. M Mays at VUL dot edu. 
It's not a hard assignment. If you follow the template that is on page uh, 122. Send me the draft of the front matter. Okay. Now give your heads up because when we talk about the body, when we get to that section, more detail. Uh, so to 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 I want to advise you that review your manual on page on pages. Uh, flip. Here we go. On pages eighty-five. On pages eighty-five and eighty-six. The body content of the final document. Review that information and be prepared to talk about chapter one, chapter two, chapter three, chapter four, chapter five, chapter six. So heads up. Review page 85 and 86. That will, everything on page 85 and 86 uh, 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 is part of the body of your dissertation. As I stated, the front matter it's very easy to do. It's just following the template. You shouldn't have any issues with the front matter. Dr. Campbell, I I, I do uh, see you. Uh, you're on mute. This is what Dr. Coleman was referring to. Some people will be on um, and doing other things. Dr. David Penn is laughing. <laughs> Director Campbell. Okay, he, may, he may not be back yet, Doctor. Um, thank, thank you, uh, Dr. Morton. Uh, 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 Dr. Dr. May, may I point something out? Yes. Uh, uh, when we did our project proposal, uh, our abstract was at least 250 words, but in the uh, in your final document, you made the abstract only 100 words. 100 words, no more. Okay. 100 words. If you go 101. You're going to have to delete a word. And to be honest, at the final defense meeting and pre-grad meeting, uh, the person that usually catch that is, is Dr. Uh, Dr. Dr. Coleman. Because uh, while the meeting is in process, Dr. Coleman will be counting the word. So 100 words Dr. Mays Dr. to be Cicely Lillard in the body content it um, asks us to in the chapter 4 give a lesson plan as I said provide a lesson plan from each facilitator now the facilitator didn't create our lesson plans we did so I'm you, 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 when he said provide a lesson plan uh, for 
for a tutor facilitator. It mm-hmm. just is only let them know what uh, they should be discussing during that, that, that presentation. Yes, Why yes. they facilitating the class. Okay. Okay. And we will get to the, uh, the all of that information in the section when we deal with uh, the body. But that's a good question. Very good question. Again, uh, uh, Dr. Campbell. Uh, Dr. Mays, since she asked that question, I'd just like to, <laughs> to tell her um, you can't teach all the classes. I didn't teach any of the classes. Okay. okay. And that, that's good, Dr. Campbell. Yeah. Uh, uh, in the past, we have had uh, candidates uh, that thought they would teach all of the classes. And the problem with that is you are not the expert yet. So you solicit experts in that field uh, uh, to facilitate those classes. You facilitate the uh, first class, which is uh, the implementation of the uh, 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 pretest, um, the orientation of the opening of the class, and that's it. Now, don't get in trouble when we look at uh, your final document and uh, your lesson plans and all, and you serve as a facilitator. Let me put it this way. When your project proposal when your committee approved your project proposal, you had the lesson plans and the instructor. That's what was approved. And that's what we want to see in the final document. Unless if change were made, you had permission from your core faculty about you. If not, you have to go back and do it over again. All right. Front matter. Any more questions? Dr. Not- Mays, I, I have a question. I just need some clarity. So you said that by the time we meet again, which is tomorrow, you would like us to send you the front matter. Yes, ma'am. So that would be all fields filled in. like all, in- all, Right. All okay. fields filled in on that table or content uh, page. Uh, the uh, copy of uh, the cover page, the copyright page, you know, all of that that's included in the front matter. Okay. So that includes like ev- at least everything that is... Uh, mandatory, right? Correct. We don't have to have all the options. No. Okay. Because some of them are going to be like in progress, like the glossary may increase as you write the body. So we have to at least have the first five, no, the first four, title page, copyright, table of contents, and abstract. Correct. Okay, and then I have one more question. Now we were given a syllabus for this. So how does the syllabus fit in and the assignments that are on the syllabus fit into this session? Right, now that syllabus that I I submitted to Dr. Morton and she submitted to you, uh, 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 do away with it. (laughs) Do away with it. Now, the syllabus that uh, you should be in each of you, in each of whatever year you may be, you should be concerned with is the syllabus that may be listed in the Moodle. Because today, and fulfilling all assignments is what's going to give you the final grade. And I know for uh, for uh, year three students, uh, I did list 
syllables. I had posted syllables in the Moodle that's uh, required for the eight-week uh, classes. So the little syllables that you have in, in your package that Dr. Morton sent, just do away with it. Okay, how many of you have gone on into Moodle and to see the Okay, did you see a syllabus? I didn't. Um, I didn't see, as of last week, I didn't see any syllabus that was attached to these classes taught today. I saw one syllabus that was in Final Colloquium. It was for Back Matter, and it was like 2020. It was an old one. Yeah. So haven't seen any, the only syllabus is, syllabi, I guess is the word, I've seen is what was attached to the email. Except for that one that was in final colloquium. No, that, that need to be corrected uh, because the syllabus, all of them were posted for just a week. The ones I saw, it on the page it had placeholder. It didn't have the syllabus. It just says placeholder. Okay. All right. Uh, anyone else have a problem? Uh, Dr. Dr. Mays, the only bits that I received was the one that was sent by the colloquium. Okay. And you said they can have that one. I haven't gotten into the Moodle. Okay. You haven't gotten into the Who else haven't gotten into the Question. Moodle? I haven't had access to a Moodle. Everybody might go in and just nothing okay. happens. Okay. Well, so that's good. I this, have wait, 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 wait. That's, that's good information I'm receiving. All right, uh, and good information. Uh, that's uh, uh, Jabbar, uh, Penn, uh, Thornton Thompson. Uh, okay, Little. Uh, Cecily, go ahead. Can those documents that have been uploaded to the Moodle, can we get them emailed to our BUL account so we can see? what we're doing or what we should be, should be doing. Okay, I will I will confer with uh, Dr. Morton and uh, Director uh, uh, Campbell and see that we, that can be done. Okay, uh, the, the deal, the, could you get in the mood? Of I got in, but I only saw a list of classes from when I started that says what I owe in terms of the documents, the assignments that I owe. Okay, I'm I'm glad you all mentioning this, uh, Doctor Morton. Yes, sir. Uh, are you taking all of this down? Yes. yes. Okay, because now now understand that there is a clinches, but we. Uh, we we share that information uh, uh, with uh, uh, tech, uh, uh personnel, uh, uh, um, uh, Chase. Mr. Chase Walthall, thank you. And that information is supposed to have been loaded up way before now into the Moodle uh, uh, system. And uh, today that the Lord has made, we shall cool. rejoice in... Who's somebody preaching? Good. They're excited about it too. Get ready to open up the service. <laughs> One thing I do know, do do not don't, don't y'all get mad with me. I do know it was not a Baptist. <laughs> we don't do things that way. <laughs> Dr. Campbell. But listen, all jokes aside, I'm 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 so appreciative that you all mentioned what you just mentioned to us. We are trying to get this new Moodle system to work, and it will work. But uh, 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 you just helped me today, and uh, Cicely, you has a good idea that we can send those uh, documents by way of email, so at least you can see what you're supposed to be doing.
to and your I visa. can't say, well, I don't have the paperwork because if I confirm that I received it via email, you know I have it. Okay, that's that's a good idea. We 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 will uh, consult with our director because I do follow my director's lead. Okay, and the other question or problem, uh, Jabal. The uh, the what you put the information that you put on the screen about front matter is that something you sent to us? No, uh, uh, no, I didn't. No, I didn't uh, is send it, that information. Is that you could send to us? Yes, I will. Bless your heart. That would be really helpful because I'm still looking for it in the book. I, I I'm, the pages are not right. Right. Okay. And the next thing, let me share with you what I do with it. Uh, how many of you have the book, The Dissertation Journal, A Practical and Comprehensive Guide to Planning, Writing, and Defending Your Dissertation? Oh, God. I see one, two, mine's up. That's three. Mine's in the mail. Yours. <laughs> Thank you, Cicely. I was going to get you, Cicely. It's in the mail. Mine's in the mail. Yours in the mail. Mm -hmm. <laughs> please, please purchase a copy of the book. Read it. Good information in this book that will help you. And okay. I would also add the only reason why I know about the book is because David Eugene Penn called me to tell me to purchase the book. Okay. Or I have known because I can't get into the Moodle. Okay. All right. And, and, and the reason I know about the book, I before disclosure, I informed Dr. Mays, I think it was last time we did the check-in, I had a conversation with him on the phone I, and I shared with Dr. Mays, I was having a challenge getting into the Moodle and in turn, Dr. Mays gave me the information I needed to have and then with regards to telling me about the book, I in turn share that information with you, Bear, and, and Little. That's great. Great. Please get the book. Dr. 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 D. Penn, you have a lot more cohorts than those two. <laughs> <laughs> Remember us, Dr. Penn. Remember we all came in together? <laughs> Dr. Mays. Somehow we have separated, but we all came in together. <laughs> That's Dr. A you know I'm messing with you, Dr. Campbell. I, uh, uh, Dr. Debbie, Tammy Thornton. Uh, if you may have said that in in laughter, but it is the truth. That's how Mays and I made it. It's true. We 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 helped each other, and we bonded and said, "If you walk, I'm gonna walk." And that was in 2004, and we still had that same relationship today. Um, so that's what it's about for you all to, that, because after this is over, you know, you walk across and get that demon terminal degree, your relationship and your fellowship doesn't stop with those who you graduate with. You know, it's a historical moment for all of you. And, uh, You'll see that as you as you move forward. I would like to ask, if I could, Mays, how many of you have an editor? Okay, I see one hand up, Dr. Kepp. I have an editor. I have one, too. I have a potential editor. Yeah, mine's is potential as well. But... Um, that's been worked on. I contacted someone from another school, and another school recommended me a list of some editors that do work for their school. Amen. So, so just working on that. It would be very helpful. Save you a lot of time. Uh, so I wanted to throw that out there. I hope that someone of you would catch it because uh, you, you, when you, when your work goes out there and the traffic you want, you know, to, it to be with excellence. Well, my editor is reading, reading my paper right now to the point that I've got it uh, uh, written. So when I, and she, I, she, I sent it to her, so she's reviewing it now. Hopefully I can get it back by this weekend. That's great. I yield back to you, Maze. Uh, thank you, Dr. Kelman. That's very important. And to piggyback uh, on uh, 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 P. 
peer groups, Dr. Campbell, uh, along with Dr. Robert Trice, the, the, the three of us, we share information. Don't be afraid to let your peer review your whatever you're written. You all are in it together. The only way your peer can help you, they have to see what you are doing. And if you can take the criticism of your peer, you're halfway there. Because if you cannot take the criticism of your peer, you're not going to take the criticism of your committee. And I must be honest, uh, beginning with me. Heads up, I'm the most critical. I'm easy to get confused. And when I get confused, I ask a lot of questions. The mean okay. you see, the mean you see today, it's not the mean in the final defense meeting. You may have heard, and what you heard may be true. May. <laughs> may. May. If I may. Go ahead, Campbell. <laughs> I'm looking. I don't see not one smile. <laughs> <laughs> Tam is smiling. <laughs> so let, let me let me give you the good news. Here's the good news. If you want to shut Maze up, and I know some of you would love to shut him up. You know, we talked about the shutdown of the government. If you want to shut Mays up, here it has, this is how it happens. When you come before the defense, if you have your stuff together, you have all your ducks in a row, I will tell you, you can shut him down. It can happen if you come in there um, prepared. If, you, if we ask you your hypothesis, <laughs> and you don't know that verbatim after three years that's a problem so you want to shut him down if you see his hand over his mouth you want to shut him down you have your your ducks in a row it will be an easy process <laughs> so I just want to help you to understand because I didn't see any smiles you know I didn't see I didn't see that maze, so <laughs> I had to, I had to throw I should, that out there, man. <laughs> maybe I shouldn't have said that, but uh, it's 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 it, it is it is it's the truth. And we'll get to the body and the abstract. In your abstract, uh, 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 uh the front matter, uh, uh, your hypothesis, if not cited, it should be referred to. And in the final defense meeting, I'm going to ask that question. If you fail to do it in the first five minutes that we give you uh, to do an overview of your work, I'm going to ask that question. And I want you to know, I will know your hypothesis because I would have reviewed your document before the meeting. And it's not the thing that I know it. You should know it. Now, that's part of the front map. Jabir, um, look on page 116 and 117 in your manual because you said you still couldn't find the pages for the table of contents for the dissertation and the final document overview and see if it's hovering around those two pages. And 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 Doctor B, the big sister, are you using your old manual or the new one? I printed out. This is the old one, and that's okay. the Jabir. I believe he's working in as well. Okay. Doctor Mays, one other question. Uh, 
All of our prior documents were written in third person. Is the final document written in third person also? Yes. Okay. Uh, Dr. Penn, you were talking. I thought I'd seen the lips moving. Now you're talking and you're on mute. I was on mute, Dr. Mays, talking with my granddaughter. She gave oh, me some I'm information. sorry. No, sir, I'm sorry. I'm oh, sorry. Okay, sorry. I, I just seen your lips move. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's my granddaughter. Okay, all right. I didn't know where you were speaking in tongues or what. <laughs> but listen, listen. Don't make your task harder than what it is. It is stressful. It takes time. You do become frustrated. But if it's your desire, if you prepare for a disappointment, if you made that conscious decision that you're going to do this, it's done. You heard me tell the story that in my final defense, I knew I had it made. I thought I was the smartest person in the room. Until the president, Dr. Ralph Reeves, stepped off the elevator, stood in the back, listening to me, and then he said, May think he's smart. Let me see how smart he really is. And he started shooting questions at me about my own work. And believe it or not, I had to urinate so bad. <laughs> That's how bad he scared me. But I made it. You're the expert. And in writing, all of we are asking that you follow the format, the template, that the university uh, uh, has given you. That's all we're asking. We're not concerned about your opinion. What you think. Have you done the research? to back up, to verify your opinion of what you think. It's a research project in the mall for two or three witnesses. Do the research. And even do the research in doing the front matter. That's why I ask you to get this book. I went, I drove all the way to Charlottesville, to UVA, to get a copy of the president dissertation, Dr. Reeves' dissertation. And I have it in my possession today. I went to Liberty and I looked at several dissertations around my project at Liberty. It's called research. If you don't visit the library, if you don't buy books, if you don't read books, if you don't comprehend or grasp something from the books you are reading, it's not a research. It's just your opinion. And that doesn't matter to us. I spend hours in UVA library. They gave me a card, thank you. They gave me a card. I went to Liberty so, so much. The, the, the librarian gave me a card, a library card. You just come on in. 
So that's all we're asking you to do. Do the research. And listen to your core faculty advisor. And you'll make it. All right, Dr. Coleman, you on my camera, you have any final words? No, I think I think we've done good for the day. Uh, look forward to tomorrow. All righty. Anyone have any questions? Now I do need, since I got 30 seconds, I do need uh the Pinkerton uh Chevrolet and Cadillac just called me. Uh, David P and my Cadillac is in the uh is in the shop. And in order to get my Cadillac back, they just called me David Penn, I need one thousand two hundred seventy-nine dollars. And uh, I'm gonna give you, I'm gonna post my cash app in one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. And uh uh will you please uh make a contribution? <laughs> So, Dr. Mays? Yes, ma'am. Calling my name, and I had to say, I'm sorry, Dr. Mays. Um, and I had to ask you again, what was your question? I was on the phone with Allstate. One of oh. my clients moved out of my house, vandalized my apartment, $20,000 worth of repair. Wow. Done. And so, when you, that happened, I was crying, but I had to try to compose myself when you were asking me a question. They are denying to pay that policy. Wow. So I'm sorry, good sir, but I cannot help you today. <laughs> <laughs> no, we need to be helping you. <laughs> my love, my love, one thousand some dollars ain't nothing. <laughs> I right, we go. Uh, 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 Cecily gonna put her cash app up, and what y'all have left over, you know, the leftovers, I take that. <laughs> You this all will break, this will not break me. I'm okay. This will the Lord will provide some way, somehow. Uh, thank you so much. And this is uh we're coming to the end for the day. Am I correct, Dr. Campbell? Yes, sir. We need to go. And we, we will see you all on tomorrow. Uh uh please have the assignment. You can email it uh, to me and uh we'll be okay. Have a blessed day. Um, Dr. He gone. Okay. Yeah. Have a good day, everyone. Dr. Jim, just come back to leave the room.